And gentlemen, a very good morning and a warm welcome to this, the first conference for 2021 brought to you by the Centre for Army Leadership. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Langley Sharp, S1 Leadership here at the Cal. Uh, today's a conference, Junior Leadership in the Digital Age, Expectations, Reality and the Future. First, I'd like to say a few thank yous to Colour Sergeant Nick Smith on secondment here to the Cal from the Infantry, uh, um, um, Infantry Battle School down in Brecon. The conference is very much his brainchild and his hard work, so Colour Smith, thank you very much indeed. Supporting him behind the camera today, but very much on point, SO2 leadership, Major Ben Acton. Uh, Mr. Chris Nicholl, W on Chris Nicholl, the senior soldier here within the team, who has again been in support and will be chairing session two today. And finally, the latest member of the team and most welcome, Dr. Linda Risso, who will be chairing session three. She's a senior researcher here at the, uh, the Cal's Research Institute. Um, now to the fun stuff, administration for the conference today. Your videos and your audio will be muted throughout. If you've got a comment or wish to provoke or engage in discussion or debate, please use the chat window at the uh, bottom of your screen. If you've got a question for any of our panelists, please use the Q&A box also at the bottom of the screen and that'll be fed through to our chairs. Timings for today will be put into the chat box uh, at the bottom of your screen, but three distinct phases. Uh, the first session, Command Sergeant Major Perspective, session two, junior leaders, session three, business and sport. The recording for today's session will be put out on our um, YouTube channel. So if you uh, Google Central Army Leadership on YouTube, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to see all our previous speaker series and conferences on there, and that'll be out next week. And we will put that out, so advertise that on our social media channels. And please do share because there are valuable lessons for us all from today's conference. So what is today all about? It is about the British Army's junior leaders, the men and women who take strategic direction and operational intent and turn it into tactical action, operating at the tip of the spear, whether that be as part of small dispersed multi-agency teams working in support of the NHS to deliver COVID response or in the thick of the fight on the battlefield. It's our young men and women, many in their early 20s, who are charged with leading in the most testing of circumstances. Our junior NCOs, and our young officers. Of the former, I am reminded of, a, of two illustrative quotes. The first from Lieutenant Colonel and later Lieutenant General retired Sir Hugh Pike, who reflected on a critical moment during the Falklands War campaign. And he said, you are struck as never before by how profoundly reliant you are on each fire team of four, each section of eight, and especially upon their leaders tough, determined, confident, youthful corporals. And more recently from our first guest today, the Army Sergeant Major W. On Patton, who said junior NCOs are the people who deliver victory on the battlefield for our commanders at the point of contact. They're the soldier that executes every order. They're the people who make soldiers leave the army and the people who make soldiers stay in the army. They are our vital ground. It is our junior NCOs who are arguably the most prevalent voice and symbol of leadership, directly leading day to day the majority of our fighting force. But it is also our young officers, many of a similar age to our Lance Corporals and our Corporals, those they are leading, but charged with the authority, responsibility and accountability that is intrinsic to their command. In many ways, these young men and women are having to deftly transition between leader and follower in their early days. As the commander, they lead by example. They set the tone and shape the climate. But they are concurrently followers, not just those more senior to them, but also those junior, drawn on the skills, knowledge and experience inherent of our NCOs, as the young officers themselves learn the intricacies of their new profession. And so today we draw upon the exposure of a broad church. Session one offers the Command Sergeant Major perspective when we are joined by the Army Sergeant Major and Command Sergeant Majors of the Field Army, the Field Army Reserve and Home Command. 
Session two is the turn of our junior leaders, both junior NCOs and young officers from the reserves, the field army, and our training establishment. And session three offers a broader perspective and a very credible panel of leaders from the sporting and business worlds will open our eyes to the leadership challenges and opportunities they face in very different contexts. There are lessons for us all here today, from private soldiers aspiring to step up to the rank of Lance Corporal, to members of the general staff, charged with the policies, directives, and orders that our junior leaders will turn into action. Or indeed leaders from the outside world, from external to the military, seeking to draw on or indeed inform our collective experience to improve leadership across our society. So I urge you to listen, engage and reflect, and in so doing, learn from the experiences presented here today in order to make yourselves better leaders tomorrow. So without further ado then, let's turn to session one, the Command Sergeant Major Perspective, and I'd like to introduce our first guest, a man that needs little introduction to the majority of our audience, the Army Sergeant Major, Warrant Officer Class 1, Gav Patton. Mr Patton joined the British Army as a light infantry, infantryman in 1987, aged 18. He served in a broad range of appointments at regimental duty and as an instructor at various training establishments, including here at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Operationally, he has seen service in Northern Ireland, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, Iraq and Afghanistan. After being regimental sergeant major of the 3rd Battalion, the Rifles, Mr. Patton was selected to attend the United States uh, Command Sergeant Major's Academy in Texas, the first to do so since 1989. On return, he commissioned to the Rifles, was selected to be the first Field Army Sergeant Major in November 2018. He was appointed as the second Sergeant Major of the Army. Mr. Patton, a very warm welcome to you this morning and thank you once again for being a pivotal ambassador for the Cal. Over to you. Uh, Colonel, good morning. Thank you very much for that, um, that introduction. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and good morning to everybody who's online and listening. Uh, and firstly, let me say thank you uh, for, for what you're doing, what your families are doing at this, at this very difficult time. And I wish you and, and all of your family well. Um, so I'm, I'm really privileged to have an opportunity to talk to you today for, uh, for 10 minutes. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, it's always gold dust ch uh, to chat with our army team, both regular reserve and, and our, serv uh, our civil service teammates too. As you've heard, my name's Gav Payton. I'm the second Sergeant Major for the Army. Uh, we've got 10 minutes to discuss the topic of junior leadership in the digital age. I want to focus on the junior NCO and why they're important. The session will be 10 minutes of you leading through my understanding, followed by some time for questions and discussion with me and the remainder of the Command Sergeant Majors. So please do, please do use this opportunity to ask me absolutely anything. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't, Hello. then, um, then yeah. I'll, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Um, my only plea is to, is to shoot straight in here. Okay. Hold me to account and challenge me on anything yeah. that you wish, because, hey, I'm still learning too. Uh, I'm going to talk about three challenges. The first one is technology and never mm -hmm. replace uh, and how it will never replace the frontline soldier and the requirement for junior leadership. Uh, the second challenge is connectivity. Uh, boots to bots, soldiers to satellites, shooters to sensors, and pixels and partners. And the third challenge is mission command, speed of decision, the strategic corporal, as you've just heard, and, uh, and the multi-domain. But before we go into any of that, please let me explain what I believe the following terms mean. So what is army leadership? Well, Field Marshal Slim would say that leadership is that mixture of example, persuasion, and compulsion, which makes soldiers do what you want them to do. I would say that it's a projection of personality. It is the most personal thing in the world because it's just plain you. Now, the doctrinal definition of army leadership is a combination of character, knowledge and action that inspires others to succeed. I would say as the army sergeant major that leadership is the ability to make others want to do what they don't want to do. And that has never changed. I've been thinking that since I was a platoon sergeant. But CGS, our current commander, would say that leadership is a behavior. It's not about who you are or the position you hold. It's about how you behave. And the leaders are those who get the rest of us to give more than we think in ourselves we have to give and to do stuff that we wouldn't have done naturally. 
like going forward when the enemy is trying to kill us. Which is why the best leaders are wholly natural and authentic, comfortable in themselves, and they make following them the most natural thing in the world, when in fact, it is anything but. So what is the digital age? We're talking about this today. Well, according to the Collins Dictionary, the digital age or the information age is a time when large amounts of information are widely available to many people, largely through computer technology. What is the junior commander? Because that's my focus and the focus of this today. Well, firstly, I, I break the army into three parts. And you heard um, Colonel Sharp talk briefly about the, the first part, which is our junior NCOs who I really do believe deliver victory on the battlefield at the point of contact for commanders. The second part is senior NCOs and warrant officers, me included, and all the command sergeant majors you talk to today. We are the bastions of standards, the guardians of traditions, and we advise our officers. And the third part, I believe, is our commissioned officers. And that's really simple because they command us. They lead our soldiers, but they always put them first. Now, I've stated that our junior commanders deliver victory on the battlefield for our commanders but it is our most junior commanders who we trust to make the right decision in a difficult situation. And this is not restricted to the battlefield. It's true for in camp also. Our junior commanders are the first layer of the leadership onion where the rubber meets the road and the soldier that executes every order. They are the people who make soldiers leave our army and they are the people who make our soldiers stay in the army. They really are our vital ground. They're the most important part of the army for me right now. So moving on to my points, now you've got an understanding of, of what I think um, these things mean. Uh, point one, technology. And I believe that it will never replace the frontline soldier and the requirement for junior leadership. Now, last mile logistics, drones, artificial intelligence powered sentry systems, swarming, you name it, technology will eventually deliver it. But technology will never, ever be able to deliver negotiation and the soft skills that only humans our soldiers possess. Now, CGS said last year that the soldier 2030 will be someone able to harness a sophisticated suite of capabilities, who is able to compute the inputs which link the satellite to the soldier, matches boots on the ground to the bots, one who's as adept at managing pixels as they are working alongside partners and proxies. Now, the battlefield has changed and it continues to change. But one thing that will endure is the requirement for soldiers to be on the ground. The future may well see metal on metal fighting the heavy fight, long range precision fires striking the deep and less metal meeting flesh in the early stages of battle. But we will always need to have humans, our soldiers, to finish the job, to resolve the situation and to negotiate an end state. Machines can't do that. The digital age moving at pace has and will continue to stretch our junior commanders. The challenge is to ensure that we have the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time. Only then can we reap the rewards of the effective junior commander who's connected to the network. The second point is connectivity. And CGS mentioned about boots to bots, soldiers to satellites, shooters to sensors, pixels and partners. And our junior commanders are expected to understand, maintain and operate a huge spectrum of sophisticated and technical lethal and non-lethal equipment, all of which when used correctly, will give us an advantage over our enemy. It makes what I used to operate as a junior commander in 99 look like a collection of cheap Fisher Price toys. We've come so far, but let's not forget how far our people have come in order to operate it. Now, in October 2020, CGS said, the future is impossible to predict. Land close combat remains a visceral and lethal contest of will. And we'll speak to young men and women who can close with and kill the enemy. The challenge for tomorrow or tomorrow's generation of future junior leaders is to continue to nurture and to nourish that fighting spirit because that's the true litmus test for the British Army. So we still need to find brave men and women who are prepared to close with and kill the enemy, that can operate cutting edge technology and who can understand the higher commander's intent in order to make effective, tactically sound decisions for the whole world to see. 
It's really scary when you think about it that way. Our junior NCOs are those very people. And in turn, we will rely on these junior NCOs to train and develop the next generation of future junior NCOs. And that is why I believe that education is so important. Follow me leadership. The stuff we all learn in our trades is great, but we must not forget the most important weapon system, our greatest asset, our people, and how we in turn nurture and nourish them psychologically with the soft skills to ensure their mind is as fit as their body, a critical factor in mission command and quick thinking. Which leads me to my third point, which is mission command, the speed of decision and the strategic corporal. And you heard the quote earlier from the Falklands. Mission command has always been important. It gives our young commanders the flexibility to carry out their commander's plan in the way which they see fit. In the digital age, with everything connected, moving at a faster pace for both friend and foe, the speed of decision making is critical and usually for the whole world to see. Now, Oli Gredner said that the military now talks about the strategic corporal, meaning that in modern day warfare, a corporal on the ground can change the overall strategy of the entire campaign. Because whatever that corporal does can instantly appear on the news from an act of heroism to a war crime. Everything is out in the open. And never before has the planet or the enemy been more connected. In an era of disinformation, fake news, and unregulated social media platforms, our enemy will try to weaponize our information, confuse us with lies, and move quickly to try and outpace us. The battlefield is fast, complex, and won't wait for anyone. And our junior commanders must be swift in their decision-making, educated on the environment they operate in, and know the bigger plan, as their actions may well influence the success of the strategic mission. Our commissioned officers, our commanders, must be able to trust our soldiers and our most junior commanders. More importantly, the junior commanders must feel trusted by their commissioned officers. And that trust must be built in camp long before deploying in operations. I grew up in an army where I would regularly hear the strap line of, yeah, that soldier nightmare in camp, but they're mega in the field and on operations. Well, I don't buy it. How can we trust soldiers to make the right decision? when they're not fed, not watered, and not rested on operations. When we cannot trust them to make the right decisions when they are fed, watered, and rested in camp. The New Zealand All Blacks, arguably the greatest rugby team in the world, state that you may be a superstar, but if you're not a nice person, we don't want you. True mission command that genuinely facilitates the speed of decision starts in peacetime, and our junior commanders are right at the centre of it. Failure is part of this trust building journey. It is critical to make available a safe place to experiment and a safe place to fail, not to be confused with a fail safe. There's a difference between mistakes and reckless behavior. The appropriate actions and getting this balance right will empower both up and down the chain of command. True mission command. The challenge of our junior leadership in the digital world, where the pace of change is brutal, our junior commanders must be brighter than ever comfortable with being uncomfortable and ready to be on the world stage in any theatre of war that other people cannot or will not ever set foot in, wherever that may be. I'll leave you my three messages. Uh, firstly, that rank is an opportunity to do more for your people. Our soldiers don't make mistakes on purpose and leave a legacy. Thanks for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. And I hope you and your family stay well at this difficult time. Colonel, thanks very much. Much. Army Sergeant Major, thank you very much indeed. Um, I owe you an apology. I put you down as joining the army in 1987, not 1997. There's plenty of youth in you yet. Um, moving on then to our second guest this morning, W. R. Keith Mills. Mr. Mills is a proud infantry soldier who joined the first battalion in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers in 1997 and followed a, a very similar career profile to that of, uh, of Mr. Patton. An impressive career at regimental duty that peaked as regimental sergeant major of the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Welsh in 2016. He too served as a colour sergeant instructor and a company sergeant major here at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. 
Operationally, Mr Mills has a wealth of experience in Northern Ireland and Afghanistan, having served three tours there. Mr Mills is also a graduate of the US Command Sergeant Majors Academy in the US. Um, after graduation, he became the uh, Command Sergeant Major of the 3rd UK Division for taking post last month as a Field Army Command Sergeant Major. Mr Mills, very good morning. Hey sir, thank you very, very much for that kind introduction and good morning to everyone online today from a, a very cold and snowy Wiltshire. Um, and I hope you are all safe and well wherever you are today. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, Keith Mills and I assume the appointment of the Command Sergeant Major for the Field Army on the 4th of January. Uh, so about a month in um, and really enjoying the opportunity for uh, the role and the responsibility. Firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to everyone um, in the room today and I remain truly humbled by the leadership, agility and resilience of you, our people. Um, and I would personally like to thank you and your families for all that you do every day. And it's certainly not been um, an easy year. But as ever, you and your families have stepped up to the challenges of COVID and I thank you all for what you have achieved um, and what you are achieving every single day. Now, today's theme is junior leadership in the digital age, um, the expectations, realities and the future. And leadership and leading in the digital age is truly, I think, a fascinating subject. Um, the world is evolving at an extremely fast pace, but what does that future hold for you and your teams as we stare down the barrel of an integrated review? Um, what challenges will the digitized future present? And more importantly, I think, what opportunity will the future offer you, our people, and how will it advance the way we um, and our teams operate every day? Well, I think for me, the army of today and the future are one in the same and the leadership challenges you face, I feel will be far greater than I personally faced during my career um, over 24 years. Because at the tactical level, the cold face, I think you must and have already started to become increasingly skilled um, and integrated across all domains as well as finding constant opportunity to integrate with not just other units, but our sister services, allies and partners. Because I think on the battlefield of today or tomorrow, we are less likely to fight alone as an organisation and more likely to fight in a unified action together, wherever that may be. That means we will all need to seek to generate, I think, tempo, and, in, and anticipate crisis as it develops, but more importantly, our speed of response will increase. Um, all of this, I think, requires an active forward presence around the world so that you and your teams are able to adapt quickly to crisis as they emerge, and you do it every day anyway. Um, you, our junior commanders, uh, I personally believe remain that link in achieving our license to operate and while the future fight might seem complex and fast on paper and in thought, one thing that I hold dear and would want you all to drive forward as junior NCOs into the digital age is the importance of basics. Um, you know, I'm an infantry soldier and it's you, me, who need to be masters of the fundamentals and ensure that your people can shoot, move and communicate but more importantly, do you personally feel comfortable sat in the turret? Do you understand how to best implement the weapon system and control uh, that weapon system to, to achieve the operational advantage on the ground? Because if you feel uncomfortable or you are unsure, then you're not, in my opinion, an expert in your battlecraft. And that's really important. Units that I see around the field army who are absolutely grounded in the fundamentals. Units who conduct, I don't know, equipment care as habit, issue orders and rehearse and seek opportunity and training value in everything they do. Units who include their soldiers within the decision-making cycle and units who routinely empower their teams. Those units 
in my opinion, are the units who perform the best, both in and out of camp when on operations. The so what to all that, I think, is the future character of conflict absolutely remains complex and you need to be prepared to step up to far greater challenges than I ever experienced as a young section commander. And daily we are seeing, uh, you know, an influx of artificial intelligence, enable technologies and the digitization of the battlefield to support the fight. But I don't think it will ever replace you, like the Army Sergeant Major said, our people, because they are the most important war fighting asset we have. It will always be inherently a human activity on the battlefield. Only people can hold and seize ground, the thing that's at stake in most conflicts. Um, autonomous machines and drones can't pick up on local atmospherics or reassure the locals. And basics done well, in my opinion, will save lives. Um, but how do we build that team in the digital age? And you know, how do we assure that all of you online today have the breadth of leadership skills required for modern military leadership? Because the future fight is now, and the reality is the way in which new generations are leading, i.e. you, globally on operations has absolutely evolved the way we do our business. Generation Z or Z, whatever you want to call it, has arrived. And that's you sat in the audience today. Many of you born the year I joined the army. And your time is now because I have had my time. And I hear lots of people say every day that the generation of today is not as good as we were or they're not as robust as we were. I just personally don't see it as I travel around the field army. You have a lot more to think about than I ever did as a section commander. And in my opinion, you are the most diverse generation we have ever had. Radically different to me, a millennial, you have entirely unique perspectives on your careers and how you define success in life. Um, but, you know, to better understand the challenges facing you and the impact on the organization, I think I want to dive into individual behaviors, attitudes, and separate the myths and stereotypes to provide context, I think, to the realities of what you face and how different we are today. So who are you? Well, Generation Z or Z are a generation with many talents, many interests, and absolute knowledge of the digital age. You have a far greater digital and technology skill set, and you are comfortable with analytics, data, code. You know, you are creative and critical in your thinking and remain, I think, connected 24 hour hours a day. When I go in the cookhouse, you know, you see soldiers, your phone never leaves your hand, and your interaction via a tweet, a text, a WhatsApp, um, and you absolutely crave information, I think, across multiple platforms, which is fantastic because, you know, you're connected. What does this mean for leaders at every level? Um, well, diversity and diversity of thought are watchwords, I think, that we need to be aware of in the digital age. And the diversity matters to the military through many dimensions. As an organisation, I think we work very, very hard to represent the spectrum of people. And ultimately, leadership will always be underpinned by those strong shared bonds, those shared values and the golden thread of belonging to an organisation, which you all volunteer to be a part of, where every member of the army feels included and part of the team. And that's really important. But to truly become and belong in the digital age, we have to diversify our talent pipeline, which is happening today with Project Castle and Alight, which can only make, I think, the team stronger. And it's about social and moral responsibility, about creating a culture where our people can be their very best. And I think our reputation and performance in the digital age is absolutely defined by how we treat our people. But, you know, what's in it for you? What do you people want and need? What do our junior commanders want out of the digital age? Well, I think people want and still crave fantastic experiences, which can only happen 
if we as leaders and junior leaders present significant opportunity and purpose, our people want to be well led and they absolutely deserve it. So take the, you know, take the time to dress away from your computer, uh, use your experience and professional competence, get out and talk with your teammates and build trust, the bedrock of a strong team. It's just about care and engage leadership and daily, I think we need to seek to upskill, develop and create a culture where everyone feels like they belong, where they feel like they can voice their opinions without fear of repercussion. Because ultimately, we are all responsible, all of us as leaders, for shaping the future of the organisation. It's our army. We are the army. If I may, um, now I think it's probably need to switch focus onto something that's really important for me and you as commanders is effective communication and mental well-being. I wanted to use COVID as an example of how important these subjects are within the digital age and communication would have been at the heart of all of your work processes during the last 18 months and during COVID it's you our juniors who have stepped up and remain professional, adaptive, agile and resilient, leading and communicating at distance every day and staying connected with your people, you know. And to quote uh, CGS and the Chief of the General Staff, we have absolutely, me included, all undergone a digital boot camp and must harness the innovation and what we have learned over the last year and drive it forward. Um, you have all enabled mission command and demonstrated trust towards your people, building that cohesive team and those strong relationships which are required by adopting, you know, innovative practices to connect with your people daily. But, you know, I know this year has took its toll and it's been extremely difficult for lots of us and your soldiers' health and well-being are extremely important facets of leading in the digital age. We really are absolutely connected 24 seven, no matter where in the world we are, um, you know, via social media, um, and it's completely changed the way we communicate and interact and our social ecosystem, even how we feel about ourselves and others. And what does that mean for you? Um, as leaders and junior leaders in the organization, well, I think we all need to have a working awareness of the spectrum of mental health, but we don't need to be mental health experts. We don't need to recognize that mental well being is a whole force activity. Um, and at the center of this well being is the need to balance investment in yourself personally as a leader and investment in the people you lead. And that includes. Uh, physical, mental and emotional health um, and you know daily ask yourself the question which of these have you and your team been neglecting lately because it's really important. I think to conclude knowing my time is running out um, I'd like to thank you all for what you do every day. Continue to share the best practices across boundary lines and accept honest mistakes Reward your people with a thank you every day. And remember that across the world right now, our allies respect us because of you. Our adversaries fear us because of you. And society is absolutely proud of you. So I thank you all for what you do every day. Thank you, Colonel. Come on, Sir Major. Thank you very much indeed. Plenty to unpack there and some real sage advice. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, next, we welcome Command Sergeant Major of Home Command, W01 Dean Morgan. Mr. Morgan joined the Army in 1995, age 16, starting his career with the 1st Battalion, the Welsh Guards. Uh, three years later, he deployed on his first operational, operational tour to Northern Ireland with their sister battalion, the Scots Guards. Further operational tours to Bosnia, Iraq and Afghanistan followed thereafter, adding breadth and depth to his, his leadership experience. Mr. Morgan assumed the role of RSM of the Welsh Guards in April 2017, before selection to be the third British student at the same US Command Sergeant Major Academy course uh, in the US. 
On graduation, W.R. Morgan was appointed Command Sergeant Major Home Command and Standing Joint Command, where he serves today. Over to you. Very good morning. Sir, thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning to everyone. And I'd just like to start again uh, by saying a thank you to you all. The leadership, especially the junior non-commissioned officer leadership that I've seen uh, from our people, especially uh, from a point of view from the SJC, which sort of uh, controls and commands all the various MACA tasks which are ongoing now uh, with regards to what RISC has been absolutely phenomenal. Our junior non-commissioned officers to continue to deliver daily. And, and for me, and on behalf of my commander, General Urch, thank you for all that you've done in the nation's fight against COVID-19. You really are making a difference every single day to our nation. So we've heard a lot about the digital age from the Army Sergeant Major and the Field Army Sergeant Major. And it's been a massive leap forward in technology. And I think the current environment and the current climate which we find ourselves now, I think that's expedited that technology somewhat. And at some times over the last couple of months, I've really felt like my nan trying to understand and use FaceTime. It's been quite difficult for me personally. But we all know, I think, what technology is available in the commercial sort of sector will evidently and, virtually, and uh, finally reach the battlefield. We're going to ask our junior NCOs to operate and command complex and more advanced equipment. This is going to be whilst contending with an enemy who is skilled in all domains of the battlefield. And that is everything from cyber to space and the nitty gritty stuff in between. And that's going to be while operating in environments such as mega cities, cities the size of Los Angeles and San Francisco. And also all the way down to subterranean, working in tunnel systems as advanced and expanse as the old Victor Victorian sewer system you see in London. They're going to be one of many operating environments we find ourselves in in the future fight. Our non commissioned officers will be asked to make bigger decisions further away from their chain of command as the operation environment becomes more dispersed. I think what's important is to understand how our junior NCOs and all non-commissioned officers really shape their leadership and inform their decisions. And for me, it's, it's three sort of tenets really, and that's experience, training, and education. But the education piece for me is really becoming a little bit more of a variable. I think our soldiers will need to be more educationally rounded and more mentally agile to take part in the future fight. And for me, education is about training your brain to be agile. The more you know, the more your brain is able to process the information it receives, convert that into data to inform your decision making. And that information you're going to be receiving in the future fight is going to be coming from many different portals. It's going to be coming from the Mark One eyeball, from the radio set, which you're wearing on your back, and it's becoming from live feeds, whether that be assets in the overhead or indeed even assets from space. I would urge everybody to grasp every single opportunity to better yourself educationally. The Army has got some great programs available to our junior non commissioned officers to really take advantage and make yourselves more educationally astute. My educational journey in the Army has not been great. And I only found out sort of towards the latter end of my uh, career how important education was. And the reason my educational journey wasn't so great was my own fault. I didn't really grasp it and take advantage of what was on offer. So I would urge you all to take advantage of what is on offer and please make sure you can educate yourselves and further yourselves educationally. It will develop you and it will make you a better leader for the future fight. However, no matter how advanced the future fight becomes, we will always still lead people. People are our greatest asset. Without people, we can't even get off the start line. And as the Army Sergeant Major mentioned, where we are the world leaders, non-commissioned officers in follow me leadership. And I honestly believe that. I've had the privilege to work with many armies, as a lot of you will have, 
and I still rate our non-commissioned officers as the best in the world. You are. We train hard at our following leadership, and that's what we do in our career courses and our various arms and services. But in times of hardship, when people are a little bit frightened, a little bit confused, a little bit tired, and don't really know what's going on, our soldiers will look for leadership. They will want to be led. And it's what they deserve. It is their right to be led by good non-commissioned officers like yourselves. I think what is more difficult to sort of train is that softer side of leadership. And for me, that is servant leadership. And servant leadership is founded and based on morally and ethically correct behaviors. It has many tenants, but the two I'd like to just quickly touch on are empathy and listening. I think it's important to understand the difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy, you need to have gone through the same life experiences and same experiences as somebody else to be able to sympathize with them. With empathy, you need to understand what they've been through. And that can be done quite easily, asking questions, taking an interest in, your pers in the personal lives of your teammates and the soldiers which you have the privilege to command. We need to understand their backstory. We are a wholly, truly, massively diverse force. And again, that's what makes us the best army in the world. Everybody is different. Everybody will have their own thought process. And that's what make, makes us brilliant. But we really need to understand our team. If we understand what their motivations are, what drags them down, what their goals in life are, what their family situation is, especially in this current environment, then we can really begin to empathize with our people and hit that core tenet to serve the leadership. I think listening is vitally important as well. And that's not just listening for what is being said, that is listening for what is being unsaid. You will know your teammates, you will know what they usually say to you, how they usually communicate with you. And just listen for what is not being said and act on it. Have the confidence to act on what is not being unsaid. That way you will get to uh, know your team a lot more uh, in their personal lives and you'll be able to do more for your people and your soldiers. But this can be done with dignity and respect and doesn't need to be intrusive. You were all good, solid junior non-commissioned officers. That's why you're in this forum today, because you want to learn. You will find a way to interact and communicate with your people without being intrusive and without doing it disrespectfully. So I'd urge you all to take time, empathize with your team, and also listen for what is being said, and more importantly, what is being unsaid. Let's talk about the uh, digital age and the future fight there and what uh, our non-commissioned officers can expect in the future fight and the, indeed the future operating environment and the need to operate more complex systems and become more mentally agile and more educationally prepared. And there are people out there who have really grasped what the army has got to offer educationally. And that for me, to see soldiers with degrees, uh, bachelors and masters, for me is absolutely phenomenal to see. But we could do more. The second part is our softer side of leadership. I think that's harder to train and that's harder to get for neat to your own personal leadership style. But I think it's important that we go that extra mile and try and understand what servant leadership is so we can really do more for our people in the future fight. Thank you again for listening, and I appreciate everything you're doing, especially for the Standing Joint Command, and I wish you all and your families the best of health in the coming weeks, months, and years. Thank you very much indeed. Again, some um, fantastic advice there and some really interesting topics you brought up that talks about quite regularly here at the CAL, not least the importance of education, but also empathy which has been a topic of uh, uh, a lot of discussion recently. Thank you. Our final guest then for, the, uh, for this first session is Field Army Reserve Command Sergeant Major, W1 Shane Marriott. Mr. Marriott had an illustrious start to his career, uh, joining the 10th Battalion, the Parachute Regiment in 1998. 
uh, sorry, 1988. In 1992, he was mobilized for 12 months as a corporal with seven para RHA. His later career uh, saw him serve time with four para and Southampton UOTC. As a warrant officer, he transferred across to D Company through P PWRR before they then uh, re-rolled to create a squadron within six Army Air Corps, where he served as a squadron star major and he promoted to W1 in 2017. It's great to have you on board with the breadth of your experience across the reserves. Mr. Marriott, a very good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, and thank you for taking 10 years off my life, which was absolutely, uh, or sorry, adding 10 years to my life, which is absolutely superb. Um, good morning, all. Uh, I hope you're all well. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to such a diverse and prestigious group of people uh, about leadership in the reserve space. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to kind of go off on a tangent uh, in regard to the other speakers, uh, the other command staff majors. Uh, I'll st start with a bit of self-indulgence with my own experience and how I see leadership uh, throughout my career in the reserves. Uh, it started back in the day uh, when the reserve force was actually called Territorial Army, or, or commonly known as a club. Uh, this club was somewhere to hang out uh, if you had a gun fetish and you liked beer. Um, possibly true, but um, in my case, uh, the experience wasn't exactly because the opportunities weren't, weren't that frequent. Uh, so we really had to work hard. I joined at 17 and a half and joined a local unit after basic training. I would ask. Uh, the platoon hierarchy was my first real introduction to leadership. And each of these individuals had most, if not all, the qualities required for good leaders. Although these methods could possibly be seen in a different light in the present day. Absolutely. Let's not forget 30 plus years ago, the tools that aid good leadership That's were right. not as available as today. Yeah, so it's very good. hard to gauge yourself to what you perceived as a decent leader, especially when you're only subject to one type. However, all of these leaders encompass and underpin the core values, respect right. for others, loyalty, self-commitment, and so on. In fact, leave it. because My platoon bonded and dug out blind for each other from the top to the bottom. It wasn't recognisable back then, but the constant communication out of reserve hours was essential. Not for being nosy, but ensuring a continuous bond with your unit members, which, as proven, is, is totally vital today. This was down to leaders. The platoon commander was an estate agent in civilian life. He had a calming demeanour and rarely raised his voice. But of course, he had someone else who could do that for him, which was the platoon sergeant. This guy dug holes for a living, hands like shovels and had a chilled forehead which indeed made him the most scariest man on earth. His fierce and nature would be absorbed by our section commanders who would act as buffers if things in the platoon weren't going so well. We worked well as a team and it became increasingly evident that we had a we culture. These such commanders had unknowingly invested in us, this culture. It's often said that the power of many is greater than the power of one. If you have good active minds in your team, I would implore you to use them share the expertise when it's available or required. This teamwork transferred into our civilian lives, where any spare time would be used helping others with manual work at home or just assisting each other where possible. Every individual brought something to the table from the heads of business, builders, roofers, IT techs, carpet fitters. Such a diverse set of individuals with skills available, each one of them in their own right committed to our unit. Working together so closely in and out of reserves enabled us to know our strengths, weaknesses and abilities, which enabled us to assist each other wherever possible. Teamwork also made us take responsibility for our own actions and our performances. It became a personal thing to make sure your kit was up together and you knew what your duties were. It taught us to be our own critic, examine how it went, how could it have been better? It's always said that nine out of 10 people evaluate their own performance harshly, as it is said that you are your own worst critic. This created this feeling of empowerment, creating leaders, not followers. Many of the unit deployed in regular battalions during the early 90s, which was a good gauge to see how the reserve and the regular force differ in leadership styles. It was also better to better ourselves as soldiers individually. These attachments produce many examples of how the diversity of a reservist can only be a positive addition to any unit or formation. This also brings responsibility not only to ourselves, but to the people we lead. One example is uh, attached to a regular battalion on ops in the early 90s. 
The company in question had an intense work pattern, so the OC granted a long weekend pass for some of the company to return home as incentive to continue to work hard. As the leave window approached, overzealous, excitable young soldiers um, got excited, had a room party causing slight damage to windows in the room. Once informed, the OC council would all leave immediately to where the perpetrators were exposed, which, of course, in those days could have took a while. During the fallout and the internal investigation, a reserve colleague of mine had obtained some bespoke glass measured specifically and silicon and putty from a local hardware store at his own expense. During the twilight hours, he repaired these window panes without anyone being aware. To cut a long story short, leave was reinstated and my colleague reimbursed for his outlay by extremely company members, extremely grateful company members. This is all down to a selfless act from a quick thinking junior soldier. He wasn't even going on leave. And in fact, he was only a carpet fitter. Even as an infantier, I found multiple times that my civilian career had equipped me to be more than an asset on deployments or attachments, ranging from building hospital bed spaces, ops rooms, repairing sangers on Herrick, to laying concrete paths for camp commandants while on courses in the UK. This develops an extreme ownership in me as an individual. I learned to ask questions. It's easy to exert blame when things go wrong, but I taught myself to count the times that I blamed others or blamed an external circumstance which had impacted on my performance or decisions. Rather than complaining, seek to actively look into solving the problem or where it went wrong instead of pointing the finger. If someone had carried out a task badly, then instead of blaming the individual, you need to look at your instruction, ascertain whether the direction was understood as ultimately it lies with you as a leader. Responsibility equals ownership. My opportunity commander once said to me before my tactics course that a plan needs to be as simple as it can possibly be, as complexity is the enemy of execution. It's also said that in the corridor of the Apple designer John Ives building in San Jose, there's a slogan, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. It didn't do them too badly, did it? If a plan is simple, then to sell that plan will be easier, but only if you believe in that plan yourself. A good example of this is something I read during, uh, during lockdown as an SF team in Iraq who learned that they'll be working closely with the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army troops were straight out of training, so had little, uh, if any, experience. Understanding that these individuals were known to desert or disappear at any point of contact, sometimes shooting themselves to get them away from the fray, became a slight concern for, the concern for the teams. The team's commanders needed to understand fully the reasons behind their decisions, so they approached their superiors for an explanation. This was simple. One day, the Iraqi army will take over completely once you've returned home. To better enable this transition sooner than later requires expert support. Knowing this, gave the commanders better ability to convince the teams to accept the decision and the greater risk to achieve the aim, making them feel better that the commanders believed in the plan also. Throughout my 33 years as a reservist, I've had the privilege to have two lives, my military and my civilian life, both of which I take extremely seriously. Of course, my main focus is my construction business, but in many ways they morph into one supporting each other. Punctuality, respect, honesty and empathy are to name just a few qualities that mirror into civilian life. These qualities are ever present and seamless throughout everything you do. I regularly employ reservists and ex-regulars in my business and I've had no doubt that the continuity between the two have, have the backbone born from the quality leadership. This said, I often work for a corporal and a lance corporal, which proves that they're not only pivotal ranks in the army, but also in civil street. The army is an ever-changing beast and the technology grows, cyber, cyber takes control. It is still vital that the leader is able to stand up and come to the fore to make conscious decisions and support their soldiers in any field to make sure we are ready at any opportunity to assist with any task deemed necessary. The most recently demonstrated during the ongoing pandemic. Don't forget though, being a leader is a gift. So use everything available to assist you to be the best leader you can possibly be. To junior command should be the best times of your life. 
Make it fun. Never let it be a chore or a burden. Every day is a school day. So learn to adapt and involve everyone as sadly in the reserves, they vote with their feet. Sometimes don't return the following week. So pending any questions, that's me rounds complete. Mr. Marriott, thank you very much indeed. I think you, you amply uh, illustrated there the, uh, the dedication, I guess, of the reserve force having to sustain a very busy civilian employment, civilian life, uh, matching that with your commitment to the reserves as well. So um, all credit to, to you all. Um, we're going to move straight on to questions. We've got about 25 minutes and we've had a number come through. Um, I'd just like to start off with um, one from, from here, and it's talking about um, the difference between leadership and leader development. Um, the premise being that we've come a long way in recent years with our leadership development as an organisation, inculcating our values and standards, the Army Leadership Code, the Army Leadership Doctrine, um, and of course, more recently, the ALDP for soldiers and, and a mature training and education pathway for the officers. officers. But I would argue that our leader development um, is, is not yet fit for purpose. And by that, I mean personalising the development journey for our individual leaders. Do you agree with that premise? And uh, what more can be done uh, in that regard? So first question over to W.R. Morgan, please, from Home Command. What, can, what more can we do to develop our individual leaders? I think, like I mentioned when I gave my sort of 10 minute spiel, I think we're really good at our follow me leadership, like the Army Sergeant Major says. And, you know, we, we all do that on our sort of career courses for our different arms and services. But I think where we could improve, shall I as it gets to say, I think it's with our servant leadership and our softer side of leadership. And I think if we get that right, that will enable the leader development. We will be able to give our people more freedom uh, to try different things, different SOPs at sort of tactical level, different TTPs, and give them a chance to fail before they sort of move on and progress with their team. And each individual, I think, will be different, to be perfectly honest. And that's where that individual sort of leader development plan could come into to action at the chain of command uh, sort of level. So each individual leader has got a different leadership style. I think each different leader will have their own leader development journey. And I think if that's um, sort of run by the sort of chain of command in the form of a, a sort of mentoring program, I think that will really see uh, some good results, to be perfectly honest. But I really do think the bedrock for all that would have to be servant leadership and giving our people space and time to be able to make mistakes, to be able to progress. And, you know, to, to use the current uh, recruitment strap line, fail, learn, win. Uh, you know, I've I failed more times than I've won um, since I've been in the army. You know, as a guardsman, I wasn't particularly uh, good at my job. Uh, I wasn't very interested in progressing. progressing. Um, I joined a reconnaissance platoon. Uh, the atmosphere was a lot more relaxed. And we had some really good leaders in there. And that's where I really learned my craft as a soldier and learned that I could pro progress in that environment. And the, what I look back and think of that now is because servant leadership was being displayed by the platoon commander and the recce platoon 2IC to give us room to try new TTPs, to give us room to develop and set us on our own leader development journey. Thanks very much indeed. I'm going to throw a similar question over to uh, Mr. Marriott in terms of the reserves, and I guess more broadly, do, do we do enough for developing our young leaders, our junior NCOs and our young officers in the reserves? Uh, well, sir, I mean, as you said, there, there, there could always be more to be done. Um, I think uh, when the key word was professionalised. Um, uh, the common theme uh, for professionals is that they usually study uh, or they're practising their field a lot. Um, I get more depth that way. Uh, therefore, I would, I would encourage uh, everyone who's looking at aspiring to better their leadership is to study it more. Look at your leaders, look at your peers, look at yourself, sports teams, businesses, uh, online and analyse, um, analyse into what leadership can, can offer you and then adapt uh, to that. So I, I think it's very much self-governing. Um, everyone's got the ingredients. It just needs to be nurtured uh, and brought out to the fore. Over. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. M Morgan, you mentioned uh, mentorship there as well. And, and a question over to um, uh, W.L. Mills in regards to 
uh, our young officers and all of you throughout your career have uh, mentored young officers, second lieutenants, lieutenants and, and captains at the early stages of their career. So what advice have you got to, to the young officers in the audience today, how to be better leaders of our, our junior commanders and our private soldiers? Um, you know, for me, mentorship is really important um, and it's an important facet of leadership because uh, the, the people you lead um, and yourselves will learn and grow from each other. Um, and, and as a junior officer at the tactical level, um, it's really important because it's, it's your bedrock. Um, it's the foundation that you will build your leadership on. Um, and so, you know, the support of the team and you listening to their internal perspectives and understanding them because they've got far greater experience at that point in time than you um, who, are, you know, effectively have just less, left phase two training and came into the platoon. Um, so that, that relationship that you form and the bonds that you form at an early age um, whilst leading that subunit is really important. And the way in which you lead, um, for me, has always been to listen, um, to understand and to develop uh, a natural trust with your people and include them within your decision-making cycle. Don't make all the decisions yourself. Uh, the team is there and, uh, uh, you know, a greater sum of minds um, creates a greater answer to solve the problems that you face. So it's a team effort. And as a, at a young age, when you're learning and developing, uh, those people in your subunit will help you grow um, and the experiences that you learn are really important at that phase in your career. Thanks very much, indeed. I, I think you're right. And I think it's one of the real, the real strengths of the British Army system, that, that symbiotic relationship between the officer corps and the NCO corps, um, moving up through the, uh, through the ranks together, that partnership between platoon commander, platoon sergeant, um, the OC and the company sergeant major, and CO and the RSM, absolutely critical. Thank you very much, indeed. Uh, moving over to some of the questions that have that have come in here. First one to do with uh, mental health. Um, and if I could throw this over to um, uh, uh, Army Sergeant Major. Sir, do you think we do enough? Uh, is there enough in place for us as Lance Corporals and Corporals to help us deal with the mental health issues that we are facing? And I guess particularly in light of, of COVID. Um, uh, coping as NCOs, but also the ability to speak about mental health to our to our soldiers. Colonel, thanks. And, uh, and thank you to whoever posed the question. Um, I think if you were to turn the clock back five, five years, you would see that we are in a much better place now with regards to, to mental health. Uh, you know, and I think we all understand that we should be, and like I say in my pitch, we need to make our brains as strong as our minds uh, and to continuously work them. OpSmart is, the, is clearly the, the tool, the, the resilience training, the AMHAB package, and that is uh, taking some time to get off the ground, but that is that is now kicking really hard in the field army. So if you haven't had that yet, then make sure that you get hold of that package because it's very it's very useful. Um, what else have we got in place for you? Well, we've got a chain of command. So for junior NCOs, you have your platoon sergeants, troop sergeants. So you have your soldier chain of command right the way to me at the top as the sergeant major of the army. Remember my line that rank is an opportunity to do more for your people. Every single soldier above you should be serving you. Uh, and that includes me. Um, so use your chain of command for advice on signposting, et cetera. Somebody will know the answer, but do not be afraid to ask. Um, you, you must be confident to ask. And that's where the challenge culture comes in. We must be comfortable with being challenged and also offering challenge and be humbled when somebody comes to your door with a question or a problem. Just remember how brave that person must have been to come to you in the first place. And they may have already pushed on a hundred other doors before they push on yours, which is open. So keep your doors open all the time. Uh, clearly you also have, uh, you have the Padre uh, and you have your officer chain as well. And I'm also working on, uh, on a piece uh, for our NCOs now, which will put lots of all the information that we, that we all talk about all the time into one place, which will be another way that you can, uh, you can use, uh, as, as a reference to, to, to get help in signpost. But um, I think as a junior NCO, my, my challenge to you would be to make sure that you, as a junior commander, know everything you can so that you can use your rank to do more for your people and to serve your soldiers. Uh, because at the time when people may need some support or signposting, that's not the time to be looking around and asking. Um, let's try and be proactive. 
identify triggers in ourselves and others um, and make sure that we feel comfortable in the way that we command and lead our people. Thanks very much, Sergeant Major. I've got a, a popular question here that I'd like to throw out to um, uh, Command Sergeant Major, both Home Command and Field Army. And it is, uh, what three things can I do as a female private in a male dominated army to succeed going forward as a Lance Corporal? And if I could come to, um, to Mr. Morgan, W.R. Morgan, please, to answer that. Yeah, that's, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, it's, I think really, you know, if you take the gender sort of piece out of it and you go for what can I be to be a better soldier, I think for me uh, would be know your craft and know it well. Understand what your job is and what the job above you is. And the third point is learn as much as you possibly can about everything. And I, did, I mentioned in my sort of piece, um, the education part. And for me, that that's vital. And that's that's a journey I wish I really started uh, sort of earlier on in, in my army career. And I think that would have helped me um, progress and it would have put me ahead of sort of my peers in my younger age. But definitely, you know, if you want to sort of strive in the army, the opportunity is there for you. But if you consider those three factors, which I've sort of mentioned there, then I think those are the sort of baseline factors for you able to progress and really drive forward and be all you can be in the army. Because it's certainly an organisation that's allowed me, a 16-year-old uh, from a council estate in Swansea, um, to do many different things that I've done. And the opportunity is there for all our people. So... Thanks very much. And over to you, Mr. Mills. Could you ask the same question, please? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, diversity of the team, I spoke about it in, in, earlier on, and it's, it's a really important feature um, of the way we do our business and the diversity of the team and the people that sit within it is something that's extremely important. But from a perspective of a junior wanting to develop themselves for the future, I think for me, there's three things. It's learn, develop, um, to ensure that you achieve um, and your overall objective. So that's, you know, learning um, all that you can uh, in the time that you've got to develop your core craft and skill to be a better person and a better operator on the ground to support your team. And that's developing by taking every opportunity that the Army presents to you um, and, and, and really grabbing onto that opportunity and pushing forward and taking those opportunities to develop yourself to make yourself a better person and to understand the organization and where you fit within that organization. Um, and effectively that will help you achieve, achieve your end goal of what it is that you want to become uh, and how you want to belong to the team. Um, so for me, it's about leading, um, learning and developing to achieve uh, whatever it is you wish to achieve in your career um, as you progress. Thanks, Sergeant Major. We're going to move on to Mission Command now, um, a, a point that was mentioned several times during the briefs, not least by the Army Sergeant Major. And again, this is a topic of consistent um, discussion uh, here. Um, and I think the premise being that we do Mission Command very well on operations, but uh, perhaps less well in barracks. And there's two questions I'd like to, to, to touch on here. One operationally focused, and it's, and it's this. And if I can come to um, uh, Mr. Morgan again on this first. He says, there is a tension between Mission Command and how technology will allow ever closer supervision of subordinate leaders. How is the army going to resist the temptation to centralize decision-making when the technology is there to do so? Uh, I think, again, that's, a, that's another great question. So thank you to whoever brought that in. To a degree, I think we're already in that space. I think with the technology we've got now, um, you know, on different operations that uh, we've all served in sort of recently. I think our every move is, is always being watched, whether that be through uh, an asset uh, in the sky or whether that be through our own sort of uh, tracking systems. And I think it's important to prove to your chain of command that you are competent, that you are responsible, and you know what the plan is in detail. And I think if you can do that, that will avoid that need for uh, a chain of command constantly be looking at your decision making uh, and sort of making you feel frustrated when you are employed in an environment where mission command is needed and again I'll, I'll go back to my sort of 10 minute speech you know in, in the future fight we are going to be operating at range we are going to be asked to make bigger decisions which have bigger consequences 
from the operational level all the way to the strategic level. But I really do think that um, as technology sort of gets, gets even more advanced, I think we will always be tracked and looked by our chain of command. It, it's going to be part of the of the part of the execution phase, if you like. But I really do think that the subordinates really do have a part to play in that as well. We all know incompetence breeds micromanagers. And if we can display that we are absolutely competent junior non-commissioned officers, I think that will relieve the need for our chain of command to maybe try to bust our sort of mission command uh, bubble, if you like. So. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Sam AJ. Turn to Mr. Mr. Marriott then for a reserve perspective. And the next question, again, linked to, to Mission Command. I guess it's about the culture of Mission Command. We all talk about Mission Command, but if a commander fails to make the right decision, he or she is held to account and gets disciplined for his or her decision. Why are we so quick to apply discipline instead of rewarding the decision as the Army Leadership Code states? So we really balance between um, reward and punishment, I guess, in, in people's decision making. Mr. Marriott. Uh, well, thanks, sir. Great, great question. Um, I'm just trying to dig that one out. Um, the, the in regards to punishment, um, we all know that decision making is, is is a process that can only be obtained properly by practice, which is why whenever um, decision making should be should, should be sort of practiced, it should be done under pressure. So all decision make well predominant amount of decision making that nine times out of ten goes wrong is under stress. So any time that we should be training, we should be doing it under stress levels. Uh, these stress levels should be higher to entice us to make decisions quicker and properly, and ultimately making the proper decision or the correct decision in that circumstance. So I think training wise uh, would, would would enable us to to encompass that. Um, as in for punishment, um, again. I think we still need to evolve. We still need to look at this uh, in regards to a reserve perspective. You know, from Friday evening, you, you've gone from a civilian to a military, and it does take you. Well, I, by the way, I see it over my experience is that you put your military head on on a Friday night, or you start that process during the day on a Friday before you actually go away on a weekend. That way, then on the Sunday night, you have to remove your military head and put your civilian head back on for the coming week. Um, to that end, to, to actually chastise someone for making decisions on a weekend that you know, wouldn't affect too much, uh, but have an impact, it would probably be improper and, and probably be diluted slightly. So on a reserve perspective to the regular side, it, it has a little, a little more impact, but like a stress, we do need to practice this under, under pressure. I hope that suits over. Great, thanks very much, Sir Major. Um, moving on to um, a very topical issue at the moment um, in the news, and this is one for the for the Army SAR Major. The recent and ongoing incident in Kenya, covered by Sky News, has brought to light a myriad of potential failures by the MOD in combating COVID. Sir, could you please clarify what the Army guidelines are for their soldiers, especially those that live with the families, in regards to their protection? And do those guidelines coincide with, uh, with those of the government? Army SAR Major. Colonel, thanks for that, and uh, and thanks for the question. Um, it's it's important that all of us as junior commanders um, have an uh, a good understanding of the force health protection measures which the army puts out, and that's put together by the SHA, the senior health advisor, and all of that is done in line with uh, with with government guidelines. Um, and us as as the British Army, you know, we take the health and well being of our personnel very 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 seriously um, and looking at Kenya you know we're looking after our soldiers there we're looking after the community in Kenya very seriously um, and the Ministry of Defence force health protection protection measures are being applied to prevent further problems out there uh, so with regards to, to families and stuff like that nothing nothing will change I recently came back from a trip where I was on a, an aircraft with somebody who tested positive I then came home and had to self-isolate. Um, it's, uh, it's important that all of us do the right thing at the right time. And if we're unsure, then we ask our chain of command. Uh, but it's important as junior commanders where that you are the first layer of the leadership onion, where the rubber meets the road, that you've had a look and you understand what's going on and what your soldiers need to do. 
Thanks very much, Sam. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It's leaders' responsibility at all levels to understand what the guidelines are and pass them on to our to our soldiers and make sure make sure that it, that, that guidance and direction is clear um, to keep us all safe. Thanks very much. Um, another question: If I can stick with the uh, the army sergeant major for this next one, but I'll, I'll broaden out to, to to the other command command sergeant major as well. So I'm sure you'll have a view, and it's to do with uh, fill your boots. So how does the top brass, and indeed us here at the Centre of Army Leadership, view what is effectively a union for the junior soldiers in the form of fill your boots? And I know it's, uh, um, you've got a good relationship with the Army Star Major, so um, over to you, please. Uh, good, again, thanks very much. So there's, uh, th there's one chain of command in the Army, and that's, and that's the Army chain of command. Um, any, uh, any external fees, the media, social media, um, all, all these other things, um, none of those are, are part of the chain of command. And I think I've, I've been quite clear since, since I started this job that, um, if, uh, that there are two types of people that we have in, in the world. You have people who, who moan about stuff and then you have people who complain about things. Uh, the people who moan about stuff just generate a negative narrative and they don't really, they don't get to the crux of the problem. They don't fix it and they fail to serve their soldiers. Um, and I think as junior commanders, what we need to be doing is, uh, is complaining about things uh, if, if things are wrong. And you can, you can complain using the, the proper procedure. And what that does is that, that then forces the chain of command to, to, to deal with it. It turns a light onto it. It forces action and it ensures that our soldiers are served. Um, Social media is a, is a great opportunity to, to, to share good information um, and to, to use as a, as a platform to get your message out there. And um, all social media is, uh, is, is good for, for that means. So, and if you talk about Philly Boots specifically, there's some, some great stuff that's been done with regards to, to mental health. The, the, the videos that were, that were pushed out for Christmas, the figures came in were, were fantastic. Um, and it, it's an opportunity for me to answer some of the questions our soldiers have got. But I don't, I don't view any social media platform as a union because clearly we don't have a union. And if, if people want things changed, actioned, etc., we should absolutely be trusting our chain of command. And remember, you know, I said that we should be using our rank as an opportunity to do more for our people. And if we're a lance corporal or a corporal or a junior NCO and we want to serve our soldiers then we should be using the chain of command to, to complain, to make things change, as opposed to um, complaining about stuff, uh, as, as opposed to just moaning about stuff and not really getting people to, not holding people to account to fix the problem. So there is procedure, please use it. Union clearly is, is illegal. I don't see any social media platform as, as a union. Um, and I engage with all social media platforms because I'm a soldier like everyone else and, and I'm learning too. So, um, Trust your chain of command, challenge your chain of command, and if your chain of command can, uh, and your chain of command will help you. Your CEO has so many levers to pull to fix things you would not believe, and uh, and if you don't feel you can speak to your your immediate chain of command, then you can speak to any of us on the call today because we're soldiers and we're here to serve you. Thanks very much, Sam Major. I, I, I'm, um, if I could just sort of, sort of reshape the question slightly for, for um, Mr. Mills there, but staying on the theme of social media, is how then as, as leaders do we, do we harness the virtues of social media whilst um, guarding against its challenges, I guess? Mr. Mills. Yes, sir. Um, you know, we've, we've grown up with social media now and we've created that environment. So live by the sword, die by the sword. And the social media platform is here to stay. And it's something that we can support um, both positively um, and use it daily um, to engage with our people. You know, for me in the field army sergeant major, my social media platforms provide me with an opportunity to provide flat, fast and accurate information to the wider sphere um, for those people that aren't necessarily connected via ModNet or haven't got um, the IX program or, or equipment to support daily um, running of their, um, you know, their organization. So for me, it, it provides an opportunity and an opportunity to send messages down and in to our people, both internally and externally, and to the wider public, um, to acknowledge some of the fantastic work that's going on across the field army, but also to support some of the key messages and themes that are coming out so that our people are aware of what's happening, why it's happening, 
um, so they can better understand the battle picture um, and we can better support them. So it's a, it's a two-way stream um, and there are some negatives to it, uh, which the Sergeant Major of the Army alluded to, uh, but also uh, for me, it's, it's, it's extremely positive as well. Um, and it's, it's a platform that we should embrace and support in the digital age because it's here to stay. So, Major, thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, it's now 10 o'clock. We're going to have to, uh, to move on. But can I just uh, extend thanks on behalf of the circa 3,000 people that are tuned in today to all four command star majors who've, who've spent the time this morning sharing their experiences, but, but also to thank you for all your hard work, dedication and professionalism, professionalism for the job you do. Good morning and, uh, and welcome to session two for uh, the Junior Leadership uh, Day. Uh, and session two, which will be focusing on the junior commander's perspective. Uh, this session is going to be broken into three, uh, three distinct parts. Uh, part one will focus mainly on the reserve leadership aspects with, uh, uh, with vignettes from Lef Lieutenant Darlington and, and Corp uh, Corporal Seal. A session uh, part two will then uh, focus on uh, the training of recruits in the digital age from Captain Russell and Corporal Richardson. And part three will focus uh, uh, solely on uh, remote leadership uh, from our, our five MedReg colleagues uh, in, in the form of uh, Captain McLaren Stewart and Corporal Ross, who is currently deployed on op rescript at, uh, at the Royal Freeman's Hospital in, in Camden in London. Uh, so to, ses to part one, uh, I introduce uh, Lieutenant Darlington and, and Corporal Steele. Uh, Lieutenant Darlington is currently the 2IC of C Squadron at Royal Yeomanry and has been in post for the last 12 months covering the, 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 the pandemic period. But also in his civilian role, he is head of operations of a director consumer startup and has a background in design engineering. Court Seal uh, is currently acting troop sergeant for three troop C Squadron Royal Yeomanry and has recently returned from Op Cabrit. As a civilian, he is a clinical lead for a phys physiotherapy company, uh, which sees him responsible for a team of clinicians as well as, a business, as well as business development. He's also currently studying for a master's of research. And their focus today and the key, key areas that they intend to hit is, make, is how to make training engaging and challenging uh, as, as, and to present it in a fully immersive environment for our reserve audience. And also, how do we continue to make this training exciting enough to recruit, train, uh, recruit and train our reserve force against a backdrop and pressures that we currently face in the civilian sector with a pandemic? A court, uh, Lieutenant Darlington and Court Seal, over to you. Uh, thanks, Cole Sergeant. Morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having us today. Firstly, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to be here and, and share our perspective as junior leaders within the Army Reserves. Today, I'd like to talk to you about technical leadership within the Reserves and specifically the digital age. To begin, we all know defence requires effect from the Army Reserve and as such, the Royal Yeomanry are currently involved in operations around the world. Subunit leadership needs to ensure that the squadron survives the pandemic, which means managing soldiers who are currently deployed and on the return, as well as engaging with and supporting non-deployed soldiers who are navigating civilian jobs, family, and now a virtual commitment to the Army Reserve. It's also worth noting that in part, we are civilians and so have been in lockdown very much for the last 12 months, working from home um, in our civilian and our military roles. The com this complexity is by no means negative and is actually an opportunity to grow as junior leaders. Today, we're going to talk to you about our perspective on this challenge, but also the benefits of leading in a digital age within the reserves and our experiences of them, specifically how, how our battle rhythm has changed, where we've needed to innovate and values and standards. Hope so. So just to give a bit of a unique perspective, the stereotypical contrast between a reservist civilian job and the military experience has always been a key pillar of attraction for a demographic of people who are looking for the challenges outside of the office job. So superficially, a civilian life has minimal boundaries and a narrow specialist of framework of competencies. Your evening is your own and you could spend years working on the same project at work. Whereas a military career, as we all know, opens wide avenues with clearly defined competencies for us to pursue. So the problem of choice is rife in the traditional army reservist. It's no wonder we're now presented with a difficult choice of whether to engage with our squadron families or not. 
without the tantalizing carrot of a field training, a field training exercise away, a Zoom call after a day on Microsoft Teams is just less appealing and it doesn't offer the contrast in life that physical training does. So, Back to you, so thank you. So with that in mind, our battle rhythm is one of these areas that has changed significantly over the last year. For example, for Sea Squadron, a third of our squadron is currently deployed on operations or overseas, and the remainder by April will not have been in the field in any truly meaningful capacity. And what we've found is that when the squadron is spread across the globe and those not deployed are working from home, our normal rhythm has suffered. This results in zero to no organic touch points. And as a consequence, we've had to innovate. Communication, as you've heard today as well, is a, is a big theme within this. And the impact that this has had is that we are now forced to add a level of formality and book a Zoom call just to speak with our team rather than briefing information outside or in the hangars in a casual and informal manner as we once did. Because of this formality and added burden of no touch points, we found that the reserves in the current climate can, can heavily blur the lines between our civilian roles and our military roles, or lives I should say, which ordinarily are quite compartmentalized structures. It can be very disruptive therefore for civilian work and for our family engagements and have a negative impact on welfare when those lines are heavily, heavily blurred. We found ourselves repurposing the manage, our management tools that the Army's provided us with in the field context, such as knowledge of the grouping system, O groups, warning orders, that sort of stuff, to define a weekly rhythm of communication that protects our soldiers' time. As Command Sergeant Major Marriott said, or explained earlier, having a connection outside of working hours with our people in the reserves is an absolute must. And it's my belief that it's this personal touch that makes this even more impactful. So, as we all know, it's far too easy to send a Charlie Charlie one WhatsApp message to the group chat rather than holding that point and formally briefing it in, a, in an O group later in the week. And really it's simple adjustments like this that have really helped to give us the greatest effect this year. They've helped to protect our soldiers time as well as us as junior leaders to maintain command and control. So the mental health benefits of reduced but more concise information should also not be overlooked. In addition to this, we've recently participated in mental health awareness sessions hosted by OpSmart, um, which was mentioned earlier on as well. Um, something that has been valued by all of our members of the squadron and is a great nod in the direction of recognising who our soldiers actually are and where they're at at the moment in time. A key thing here is to not let the Army Reserve commitments become another stress on top of our civvy jobs. Our Army Reserve squadrons are and always will be a support network and junior NCOs are really well placed as well as junior lead, um, troop leaders are well placed to voice upwards and down in that chain of command. We've also learned that we needed to innovate socially as well and find ways to spend time together as a team while within an engaging and an enjoyable setting something that we all know too well has been a challenge this year. A recent Burns night dinner over Zoom saw portions of haggis, neeps and tatties delivered to the squadron home and abroad. All of the normal traditions were followed with our squadron sergeant major leading the night in his finest tartan. Our soldiers have commented that this has been the most social engagement they've had since March last year, whether military or from their civilian jobs. It has honestly been a significant and much needed morale boost for all of us. And really, it's times like these where I realise that junior leaders can shine the brightest by delivering innovative welfare ideas that have real impact on people's lives, even within the constraints of a virtual world. And then lastly, values and standards within the reserve context. The, the Army Reserve has significantly less time in camp, life, uh, in camp life than a regular unit does. So therefore, we're, we're prone to talking about values and standards in, very much in the context of being out in the field. And, and something that I've been acutely aware of this year is that clearly the, the core values do not change or alter just because we're in the field or barracks. But actually, they don't change whether we're in the digital world as well, be that working from home. And therefore, our behaviours need to be redefined and adjusted for the digital environment, just like we've shaped them over the years for the field and barracks. 
I think simple examples such as being clean shaven on a Zoom call, having your camera on so you can be seen to not be distracted really help lend themselves towards this. As junior leaders, we get to set that example. And it is something that we as a squadron are constantly adjusting in order to find the balance between what is practical, but also what is achievable. And I personally really feel that in this digital world, we need not enforce these values, but we actually need to encourage them. And it's our role as junior leaders that we can really set the tone of that and encourage the standards, the right behaviors, and particularly within the reserves, um, as again, Mr. Marriott mentioned earlier, the, the troops will vote with their feet. So it's very much command by consent. And so tact and approach are even more important in the digital age when it's just far too easy not to dial in. Thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective and thank you for listening. Call Sergeant. Lieutenant Arlington and uh, uh, Corporal Steele, thank you very much for your interesting insights from a reserve leadership perspective. Uh, and so we, we're going to move on now to part two of this, uh, of this session, uh, where we're going to focus on training recruits in the digital age. Uh, Captain Russell uh, commissioned into the Royal Anglian Regiment in August 2017, and after assuming command of 10 platoon deployed to Kenya, and, the, uh, and then subsequently the battalion deployed on Optoral, Optoral 7, ensuring the safety of senior civilian advisors and two-star generals with their Afghan counter counterparts. Posted to ITC Catrick in May 2019 as a platoon command instructor, having passed out two platoons and the pandemic striking and lockdown being enforced, he created a YouTube channel that featured a series called Civilian to Soldier, which follows a platoon from day one, week one, uh, right through to the end of the course. This has gained almost 11,000 uh, subscribers and 800,000 channel uh, views in a short period. And also to Corporal Richardson, he joined the army in May 2011 and subsequently posted to second Fusiliers. He immediately underwent pre-deployment training and um, became part of the Theatre Reserve Battalion deploying to Afghanistan as a lead company group. In 2014, he returned to complete his section commander's battlefield course with a distinction uh, before deploying to Kenya, Canada, Lithuania and Brunei. He's also deployed on uh, OP Orbital on three separate occasions as an urban ops instructor. And the focus of this discussion, uh, as I've already mentioned, will, will predominantly be aimed at uh, training recruits in the digital age and using our digital platforms to fully immerse them in that training uh, orientation. And they're going to focus on these two main areas of how well prepared our junior NCOs and junior officers are with tech and how digitally experienced enough they are in its utility. And are we meeting the expectations of the recruits and how we meet those expectations and how do we help uh, to gain that, gain that, uh, that requirement. So, Captain Russell and uh, Court Richardson, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nicol. Uh, and it's a genuine privilege to uh, to be able to share my thoughts with such a wide audience today. Um, I think one of the key parts for, uh, and I'll refer back to the overall title, which is expectations, realities, and the future. One of the key parts about being an instructor. Um, at the Infantry Training Centre uh, in terms of expectations that you're expected to be able to come in and train the next generation of soldiers. And that goes part and parcel with the job. Um, I think the realities is that, yes, we do come here and we are able to train the next generation of soldiers. But with uh, the next generation of soldiers being used to having information literally at their fingertips, um, I think it presents a couple of different challenges. One challenge is, are we utilizing the uh, digital capability that we have to its full utility? And I'd argue that potentially not. And I know Corporal Richardson will come in with a few points of uh, specifics, but I just want to touch on a few things we have um, in our arsenal at the Infantry Training Center. One is a ProWise board, which is an interactive whiteboard. Um, now, this ProWise board is really fit for purpose and it brings lessons to life, particularly platoon attacks. When uh, I've been teaching platoon attacks, you can build, um, instead of going to a slide where there's loads of different arrows, uh, some smoke, some left flanking action, and it looks a bit confusing, um, you can actually build it from scratch. Okay, so you can build the, it from scratch and it, it allows the recruits to follow the learning a bit more of a, a simple journey to get to the end state. Um, however, I'd argue that maybe the training given 
isn't uh, enough for instructors here, which are junior officers and junior NCOs predominantly, um, to really utilize it to its full capability. Speaking from a personal perspective, uh, whilst doing the Civilian to Soldier series for YouTube, um, I basically bought a, a GoPro. And yes, the end state was a video that looked relatively cool that went on YouTube. But actually, what was great about the training purpose for the recruits was I was able to show them uh, the intricacies of an attack from a di any different perspective, whether it was from a rifleman, whether it was from a section commander, or whether it was from myself as a platoon commander. And we could actually play that back uh, on a screen and go through things uh, like TTPs, um, or espe especially in an urban environment, uh, and go through that. Now, that was just a personal GoPro. Um, and I know that maybe we haven't got enough GoPros in the systems, which is a really easy bit of kit uh, to use, um, to utilize it fully to get the best training value from the, uh, from the recruits. Another part of that question is digital experience. And I think, uh, I know the Army Sergeant Majors uh, referenced this before in a previous um, Centre for Army Leadership Conference. And I think digital experience is different now uh, than experience in general. When I first arrived to battalion, I was meant. Uh, I had my platoon sergeant that could meant uh, that was a mentor. I had senior officers in the mess. I had my company commander, all helped train me and shape me in those first few years for sure. Um, but here with digital experience, the recruits, uh, anyone you know in Generation Z, has almost a better understanding than we do. So I think it could be a slight uncomfortable shift to allow the training to go down up instead of uh, up down, which is a unique perspective in this, in this age. Before I hand over to Corporal Richardson, um, I'll just go on to the second part, which is, are we meeting the expectations of the recruits? I think, so particularly speaking from a training team perspective from Catterick, I think I've been thoroughly impressed by junior NCOs, and I continue to be thoroughly impressed by junior NCOs. Are we meeting the expectations of the recruits in training? Absolutely. I think the junior NCOs um, do a fantastic job to create uh, or to follow the training program and make sure that we turn out good level soldiers to, to arrive to the field army. But I'd argue that we can do more before the recruits get here. A simple thing with the, the YouTube series was that many of the recruits who were the target audience just a few weeks previous in terms of people that wanted to join the army, all of them said that they would have preferred uh, to have some sort of series on YouTube that they could watch and it would help shape their preparation. So I think there's still more to do in terms of meeting the expectations of the recruits before they arrive in training. And we could potentially arrive with uh, recruits that have a better understanding uh, and general knowledge or general military knowledge and also potentially better fitness levels, purely because they know a little bit more about the job that they're going to be going into. Um, I probably stole uh, a bit too much time there, so I'll, I'll hand over to Corporal Richardson uh, to go with a li little bit more detail uh, in to some of the questions. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Uh, so just to take it back to the first point of how well prepared are junior leaders with tech? And are we uh, digitally experienced enough to utilize it? I think generally as a cohort, uh, we're not digitally experienced enough. You know, um, although we are convinced that we are, everyone in the audience, I'm sure, will tell themselves, no, no, no. I know my way around the phone. I know my, my way around um, around tech. But um, in terms of things, especially in Catrick, that are specific to the job, so that's in, uh, emails, how many times have you sent an email officially to X, Y, Z, and you know, constructing and amending spreadsheets, which are, there's a, a point I'll raise that uh, emphasizes this point quite a lot. And then also to produce PowerPoints and, and use ProWise, as Captain Russell mentioned earlier. Uh, change isn't a bad thing. So when I first came to Catrick, I first went to Catrick, uh, I was expecting PowerPoints, outdoor lessons. And then I was thrown into the depths of uh, ProWise and I thought, I, I'm not sure I can utilize this. Uh, having spent a bit of time around it, and it's just, being open to change and being open to new things, you truly uh, realize how much power there is behind a lot of this new tech that's coming in and that's available to us. So I think my biggest uh, point to make uh, to junior leaders, especially coming into a training environment, is be open and be willing to learn about things. Uh, 
being willing to learn about things essentially has the one the biggest outcome and probably the outcome that's most important to me and the outcome that is least understood and least recorded in the army and it's, it's all about time saving not necessarily putting corners but being efficient with your time and buying yourself time importantly for your own personal development or buy more time for recruits which again is equally important uh so an example of of um me saving time or my training team saving time with a, ba a basic, very basic understanding of uh, current tech we use. Uh, we create their shooting record on uh, Excel. So essentially, a bit of a bottom line up, up front, a shooting record is essentially where we recruit, um, where we record all the information from recruit shooting. Uh, in there, there's a couple of other stuff like the specialist trainings that include stuff like comms training, uh, PCD training, all the rest of it. So on average, it takes about 15 minutes uh, to enter one shoot's details by hand onto the shooting record. Obviously, we are uh, we have on average 12 recruits. Now, there's an Excel spreadsheet that was produced and refined by the training team, again, with basic understanding of Excel. Now it takes two minutes to in insert, uh, insert that data into the spreadsheet. Now, doesn't sound like too much. Oh, congratulations, you saved yourself 13 minutes of time. However, in the shooting record over the duration of a six month course, there's 40 plus entries. So with 40 plus entries, the time saved over six months for one individual, just using a spreadsheet and not writing it by hand is eight hours and 40 minutes. That's one piece, one tiny, tiny piece of a, of a CIC course and eight hours has now been saved. If you now apply that logic to everything else that you do, you know, potentially you could be saving yourself 20, 30, 40 hours over a six month course and how much you can get done in that 20, uh, 20 to 30 to 40 hours, you know, is pretty incredible. Whether that's sat in your bed in your duds, you know, just having a bit of time to yourself and resting or whether that's pushing yourself forward for courses. Um, I think the important part of that is, is, you know, how do you get to the point? So you've got an idea, you know what it needs to look like. The middle, the middle bit is probably what most people struggle on. You know, how do I make a spreadsheet? That does all the all this fancy stuff. How would you produce a punchy pro-wise lesson utilizing every tool that I can? That middle bit is down to us. So we can identify that the training isn't there and we can push forward for that training to get there. But however, that doesn't fix the problem in the here and now. So we need to push ourselves as junior commanders to find the, uh, the facets of that information, whether that's you know networking, whether you're on Twitter and asking questions on Twitter, whether you're on Defense Connect whether you're speaking to your peers or importantly, whether you're using your SLCs, which I can guarantee 90% of the people in this audience have not used their SLCs. So look for, look online, you know, look for Office 365 courses and spend your SLCs on it. Speak to friends, jump on Twitter. There's so much information out there and it's down to us as commanders to identify where we can get that information from, produce a, a solid product and push that up to the chain of command rather than saying the training is not there, I can't do it. Yeah, why not produce a product having self-taught yourself, push that to the chain of command and, and say, this is exactly what I can achieve with this kind of training. Can we get this formalized? Uh, so then moving on uh, to the second question, you know, are we meeting the expect expectations of recruits? I know Captain Russell mentioned a lot of stuff uh, before training. I want to touch on the stuff sort of in training. Uh, so in my opinion, we are meeting the expectations of recruits. You know, it's our own expectations as junior commanders that aren't being met. Um, so the recruits coming to Catrick know no different. They come to Catrick, we throw them through, you know, uh, through the sausage factory and they get fired out the other end, you know, a good soldier. It's more when the junior commanders get to Catrick that we then go, oh, this is how it is. I, this is not what I expected. So it's more, uh, the thing for us is more to have our own expectation management and realize what's going on. But that isn't to say that we can't change, change things. So, my first experience on my first course, you know, I jumped into what I was thinking was going to be a punchy CIC course, uh, and I found the training quite bland and vanilla. However, the point to this is the training itself ticks the boxes and gets people to the standard expected. That doesn't mean, as a junior commander, that we can't inject into that training and improve it or make it that bit much more and a bit more punchy. You know, so a few examples of it, uh, we, was, we were deployed on one of our inter exercises, so the recruits have probably been in training about nine, 10 weeks. Uh, we realized that the Royal Irish were on the same area. So we liaised with the Royal Irish. Before you know it, we've got a meet and greet with the Royal Irish and they're going through all the sort of company assets, tap dogs, vehicles, company SOPs. And for recruits at week nine, we're sort of blown away and you know, taken back by how much they're actually using the army. 
this wasn't arranged by the company. This wasn't arranged by between commanders. This was rain, arranged by the corporals. So it's all about just keeping your ear to the ground. Another example, uh, Final X, about three months ago, uh, we ended up getting CH lift into a final attack. And we also got Wildcat uh, to, to give a, a sort of Mer or a Kazivak element to one of our uh, actions. Again, not, not, um, not organized by the company, not organized by ITC, organized by screws and platoon commanders, you know, junior officers have just all, essentially all they've done is kept their ears to the ground, found um, something that could, would be useful and exploited it. Um, probably moving on to my final point then is choose your hills, uh, choo choose your hills that you'd like to die on, but don't be put off by the change you won't experience in your time. Again, it goes back to the point of in the here and now, I need this, it's not available to me. You have two. You have two options: teach yourself and push it forward, or you know, resting your laurels, do the bare minimum. Don't need to do it. I'm not bothered. It's not there for me. It's not being given to me on a on a plate, so I'm, it's not going to happen. If you choose your hill to die on, you know, exploit that. Do as much as you can. Teach yourself. Teach those around you. And push that up as a massive case file to fire up the chain of command and say, "This is what we need, and here is the product." Because there's a lot of people who don't fully understand training in the digital age. And there's a lot of people who do, don't get me wrong, but it's down to us to produce, you know, the evidence and say, this is, this is what can be achieved. Um, and I think that might just finish me up. Uh, I'll hand you back to you, Captain Russell to finish off. Yeah, thanks very much. I really agree with the point that it's definitely uh, sort of from the ground roots up in terms of the digital age and i think that's the the final point that i'll, I'll echo is um and i'll revert back to essentially what the army sergeant major said a few a few months ago i believe in a, a different conference was that it could it can be quite uncomfortable uh potentially for the chain of command to allow the um the foundations of potentially the digital age to be uh, grounded or to be founded from the ground up instead of the top down and another example of that is battalion media officers is usually just a young officer that is pinged essentially to to run with the media across the battalion and i think the the a quote that i'll say is um we teach policy and maybe not utility which is essentially that the battalion media officer in that aspect will know how to run with uh, or know the policy surrounding certain parts, but maybe not the best uh, way to maximize a post or engagement or piece of content or whatever it is. And I think that um, our knowledge is definitely going to be from the younger generations and the generations coming through that are used to, um, that are used to uh, technology a bit more than, than maybe we were when we grew up in school. Uh, and that's, that's the final point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Captain Richardson and, and, and sorry, Corporal Richardson and uh, Captain uh, Russell. Um, so we'll move on now to uh, part three of this session uh, where we're going to focus more on the remote leadership aspects. Uh, and our speakers will be Captain uh, McLaren Stewart and, and Corporal Ross. Uh, Captain McLaren Stewart joined the Army in uh, January 2018 and commissioned into uh, the Medical Corps. It was posted to five armoured Med Reg. Shortly after arriving, he deployed to Kenya to Skari Serpent, and where he was responsible for managing a dispersed team of medics across hundreds of kilometers in Kenya. While delivering medical training and military capacity building to both uh, Kenyan Defense Forces, uh, embassy personnel and civilians, he also engaged and oversaw community projects which helped to improve force health protection measures. Uh, on return from Kenya, he's been at the forefront of leading with strike development within the medical chain. Corporal Ross joined the Army in uh, November 2008 and was posted to 5 Med Reg, and he deployed on Kenya to Ascari Serpent Batis and Exercise Prairie Storm. In 2013, after completing his Class 1 CMT Medics course, he deployed on Op 18 with two Scots as part of the Police Mentoring and Advisory Group, and on return and on promotion, he moved to RTR, where he deployed on Exercise Safe Surya and Kanjar Amon. And more recently and currently, uh, Corporal Ross is, is, is deployed on op rescript, supporting uh, the London Royal Free Hospital in Camden as part of the MACA taskings uh, with the Ministry of Defence supporting uh, government organisations. And they're really going to focus on the main areas of managing highly dispersed teams, uh, particularly from their experiences uh, operating in Kenya and Oman, and also will cover some of the lessons that they've learned 
and then what actions they have taken to mitigate uh, some of the failures that may have taken place during uh, managing those teams. Councilman Karen Stewart and Court Ross, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, so as mums, ladies and gents, so um, I'm going to have to apologise because my talk is mainly from a medical standpoint because it's, it's what I do, it's what I know. Um, but I think most of my points will be, will be relevant to most, if not all, trades across the British Army. So remote leadership then. If we're, if we're talking from a sense of a soldier working remotely with minimal supervision, as in uh, a medic working with a company or a craftsman with a squadron, or a, a rifleman on an STT, then I'm a, a strong believer in the fact that if these junior soldiers are taught well, mentored well from the moment of their first post and when they first rock up to their first battalions or regiments until the time of said deployment, then they will need very little leadership and very little mentoring at that time because they'll know their jobs inside and out and they'll know what's expected of them and they'll know what to do. Um, and I feel this task falls massively on junior NCOs um, all across the British Army, myself included, to be the ones to, to mentor, to do the teaching and to pass on our lessons learned to these junior soldiers in order for them to be ready to deploy remotely and uh, and alone and I don't, I don't mean alone as in they're on their own I mean alone as in the sense that they might be the only person within that multiple that can do their specific job their specific role um, and you're never more alone than when it all goes completely wrong and you're the only person about that can do that job um, so for both the mentors and the mentees I think it, it comes down to two things um, confidence and experience um, you gain confidence by gaining experience. It can't really happen the other way around. Um, and it comes to, uh, I got obsessed with a thing I got taught recently called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Those of you who know what it is, happy days. If you don't, it's basically in a nutshell, it's confidence over experience um, and how you can have bags and bags and bags of experience. But if you've got no confidence in your own ability and what you can do, then it won't work. Uh, and the same, the flip side of the coin. You, if you're, you could have a hundred, loads and loads of confidence, be overconfident. But if you've got, not got the experience to back that confidence up, then it's not gonna work also, you're gonna pile in. Um, so how do we gain this experience then? Um, I feel that access to equipment and to facilities in order to train regularly and often is, is massively key in order to gain this experience. Um, and also access to SMEs. And it all goes back to what I said about mentors and mentee, mentees, sorry, having confidence and experience. And it's about having the, the obviously the, the confidence and experience to say, you don't know what you're on about. And if you don't know what you're on about, get someone in that does. Because the only thing worse than no training is bad training. Um, but yeah, going back to equipment and facilities, I'm not talking facilities in Amman, Batas, Kenya, big, big places. I'm talking, even if you have like a little small bespoke facility on your own camp that you can, a drop of a hat, just go and train, go and practice with the equipment and really hone your skills, learn your craft slowly, then it will help your junior, junior, junior soldiers, sorry, on the, uh, on the eve of their whatever deployment they're going on to really get, get used to working so they don't need to be supervised and mentored as much. Um, so yeah, like I said, teaching early and perfecting your craft because these lessons taught now may very well be the lessons that these junior soldiers fall back on when everything's going horrendously wrong. Um, and then slowly perfecting your craft, you'll get these suitably qualified and experienced personnel that you need to deploy on these on these taskings remotely and working with very little supervision. Uh, like I said, we're working within the NHS at the moment um, in the Royal Free Hospital, and we were quite blessed. We had really good lessons delivered to us. They, our chain of command preempted it, gave us brilliant lessons that teed us up ready for this. So we're not sinking as much as we would have 
if we hadn't have had them lessons delivered. So yeah, that's that's what I took from that. If I'm completely, completely, massively wrong, and this whole talk was supposed to be about working from home, then uh, then I feel that the points are probably still valid. Um, you're just giving yourself the time and the groundwork to bang out all the theory lessons for the big punchy practical lessons you'll do when you get back to proper work. But yeah, um, confidence and experience. Gain, gain experience, the confidence will come. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Corporal Ross. Um, I'm Captain Callum McLaren Stewart. Um, I'm just going to add to a few things that Corporal Ross has spoken about with remote leadership. So, like all leaders in the Army, I've sat through endless lectures, discussions, and courses, all focused around different ways of leading and the best way to manage teams in various situations. But the one thing I've learned since commissioning is that there is absolutely no substitute for experience, which is essentially just putting all of that theory into practical action. So, in my case, experience comes mainly from being a troop commander, which I did for two years, and from leading my teams of medics across various deployments and exercises. And the thing I want to talk to you all about today is my experience as leading a short-term training team in Kenya, and the lessons I learned while managing and coordinating my team over a distance of about 300 kilometers. Now, during the four weeks I spent there with my team, we were responsible for delivering medical training at military bases from Nairobi to Archer's Post, so about the 300 kilometer distance, and also working within communities supporting orphanages, you know, whether that was in villages at the foot of Mount Kenya or deep within Nairobi itself. And in many ways, leading such a dispersed and remote team is very, is very similar to what the military faces today. And that's the problem of leading while being separated from your team. So the most important lesson I learned was mission command. Uh, it's been spoken about already, but essentially what it boils down to is empowering your juniors. And now this is the natural progression from what Corporal Ross was talking about because it's trusting that your subordinates have the skills to carry out their missions. And although I appreciate it's a bit of a leadership buzzword at the moment, the fact remains that in my experience, it's the single best way to lead your team. Now, in Kenya, mission command was the only way I could achieve all of my tasks, since it was impossible for me to be in six places at once. Uh, setting this up was really easy. I had six teams, each led by an NCO, and each with a specific task. My job was to oversee all six of those teams. So to me, mission command meant allowing them to conduct their jobs in their own way without me interfering too much. And for my part, I just had to give a clear intent explaining what I wanted them to achieve. And this helped develop the sense of trust between me and the teams. And this trust proved vital because it allowed me to keep focused on what was really important. Um, the result from this was freedom for me to be able to move around and pick the problems I needed to deal with urgently and freedom for my NCOs to work remotely and to develop their own skills. Now, the second thing I want to talk about, which ties in really closely with Mission Command, is communication. Now, communication is something we all know is important, but don't necessarily do that well. Now, too much communication, and I would start to stifle the independence of my team. Too little, and I wouldn't have a clear picture of what was going on. So how do you find the balance? And for me, that balance was enough to know that the missions were going as planned. I didn't need a full breakdown of the events of each day, I just needed the outcome, the risks, and if necessary, the problems. Now, thankfully for my deployment, there weren't too many problems. That was until a vehicle carrying four medics flipped onto its roof on a Kenyan road. Now, by stroke of luck, I happened to drive past this accident a few minutes after it occurred, which meant that I was on hand to deal with it. Um, thankfully, by being merit of RAMC, there were plenty of medics around to help deal with the injuries, which freed me up to deal with all the communicating. Now, our biggest concern during this was that there was a medic stuck in a vehicle and given the way the roof had caved in they couldn't get out so medical evacuation was pretty much our only option at this point now medical evacuation relies on a lot of moving parts and so communication quickly became a matter of prioritization and execution the most urgent bit was getting a helicopter moving so as to minimize the time between point of injury and hospital care and this was relatively easy because we already had a medical plan in place for incidents such as this so it was just a matter of enacting what we'd rehearsed, giving some grid references and setting up a helicopter landing site. Uh, next problem was the ever-growing crowd of locals who had been drawn to the crash. For obvious reasons, we didn't want them getting involved and crowding around the vehicle. So after some short liaising with local police, we got up the military police to help us establish a cordon and keep the crash site free. And finally, with those immediate problems dealt with, I took the time to call back and inform my boss what had happened, what we'd done to fix it, and arrange someone to come and collect the flipped vehicle. 
The outcome was pretty good. Within an hour, we had one soldier in the back of a helicopter on the way to a hospital. A crowd effectively contained and all British forces on their way back to base without anything else serious happening. And the key to this all was effective communication. It was knowing what I had to prioritise and who I needed to speak to in order to make it happen, which helped bridge the, the big distances between each of the parties. Now, once all the calls had been made, I was then able to take a back seat and let the experts deal with the individual problems. So why is this all relevant today? Well, at the moment, we're living in an age of work from home, and I know a lot of people in the military have felt the effects of it. Um, this can be quite uncomfortable at times because you can go weeks at a time without seeing your teams, whether those are your soldiers or the people you work with. And this is challenging because as a leader, you're held accountable for the actions and the output of your team. So every instinct wants you to go ahead and call and keep on chatting and putting pressure on people to achieve what they need to be doing. But the simple fact remains that it's impossible to be everywhere at the same time when your team is remote. So your best option is mission command and trusting the people underneath you to do what they need to do. Now at Santos, we were taught to delegate until you feel uncomfortable. And it wasn't until Kenya that I really fully understood what this means. Mission command frees leaders from details they don't need to know and it enables you to focus on your priorities and not get bogged down with information. And what is it that enables mission command? Communication. So long as the right information goes to the right people and you're honest about risks and problems, then you can intervene when necessary. By trusting and communicating with my five other teams, I was free to focus on the most urgent problem and communicate with everyone who could help me fix it. And while I appreciate car crashes and medical evacuations aren't daily running for anyone in the military, the lessons have stayed with me through COVID to today. The true strength of any military situation comes from the ability of its leaders to build energy, trust and initiative into their teams and keep in command, but not stifling positive and highly motivated action. If you empower and you communicate, you won't be going far wrong. Um, that's all I've got on remote leadership. So thanks for listening and I'll pass it back. Thank you very much, sir. Um, what we're going to move do uh, now is uh, move into a and a session. Um, so if I could just ask all the, the presenters that have uh, just spoken, if you just turn your cameras on uh, and then we'll uh, direct the questions uh, as, as they come in. Uh, and to start us off is, is a question about returning to the new normal. And how do we see, uh, in effect, the reserves and the army as a whole? As we start to return to normality, what lessons do we as leaders or as leaders can we take away and carry forward from this pandemic? And I'm going to start with uh, Captain Russell. Uh, from IC Catrick. So uh, I think the, the pandemic presented uh, quite a few dramas, um, obviously, but I think actually junior leaders, I, I remember uh, Colonel Sharp saying in a, in a previous uh, conference that, you know, to lead is a doing verb. And then actually over the pandemic, we've done exactly that. We've, uh, we've done, we've created action, we've done stuff. So what did we do at ITC? Well, actually, it all went remote, uh, but the recruits still needed to be trained in order to hit the field army requirements. So actually, it was a, it was a big part um, that needed to continue. So we saw junior NCOs specifically and junior officers uh, create online training packages where they could stay in comms with the recruits, um, keep them accountable during fitness, uh, military knowledge, whatever it was. Um, and also, you know, stay on top of their either mental health, physical health uh, and general well-being. So I think to answer the question is we've already experienced um, or had enough experience now over almost a year of how to potentially, you know, go remote. Um, and it's not always essential to have all of your men there. I know from my time in platoon commander battalion uh, that to have your platoon in barracks full uh, was very, very rare. So actually utilizing WhatsApp or whatever was a great way to stay in communication. Now we've, we're using Zoom for this, which is another uh, piece of evidence that it does work. So I think if we continue to incorporate all these ideas um, into our new normality without overworking, I saw something on the chat about, um, you know, constant feed of information, maybe not always required. If we can get a happy balance, then actually the new normal uh, could allow us to keep in comms with our our men, uh, our, men our men and women uh, more regularly and maybe slightly better uh, and continue a training package, um, especially in terms of uh, a training perspective, continue a training package where maybe not everyone is already uh, always readily available. I hope that answers the question. 
Uh, yes, Captain Russell, I, I just want to turn that over to uh, to Lieutenant Darlington and Court Steel from the reserves aspect, because you know clearly, uh, uh, to a degree, the, the the normality within the army is still continuing to train, albeit with some certain uh, force health protection measures. Um, but the reserves have really been hit in regards to their drill nights and their weekend training aspects. So, uh, Court Steel, Lieutenant Darlington, if you want to drop in. Thank you. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, um, and, I, and I, I can't speak for all of the reserves, but I think particularly the Royal Yeomanry is going to be a real challenge for us when when sort of life gets back to normal, if it will. Um, as I said, we you know a third of, of my squadrons currently on operations. When they come back, they're going to be at the top of their game. Two thirds won't have been in the field, right? So we're going to have this really really deep imbalance of of experience and skill fade. And, and something that I'm starting to think about um, is making sure we, we, we really acknowledge the change in situation. I think when we switched from real life to, to working from home, I, I'm, you know, I'll be honest to say we took a bit longer to acknowledge that and make the shift as we should have done. And I'm really keen on the, as we're coming out of this to make sure that we manage that situation really well and be effective. So, so what I'm really getting at is we're going to have soldiers that are experienced, soldiers that are less so, and we need to be conscious that as we come out of lockdown, we can still use digital tools, as Captain Russell said, to get the best effect. You know, we're a, we're a squadron that's based across most of the southeast in some regards, or certainly the regiment over half of the country. Um, so let's utilise Zoom and, and, and leverage technology where possible. But also, as I said, as we leave that situation let's be really conscious of people's time and time and where their priorities need to be we're going to have people with work constraints because they've been been made redundant or furloughed that are going to have to get back into their civilian career so we're going to need to give them the time although from a military perspective we're going to want to start training as soon as possible um but i think it's really comes back to those softer skills that we talked about the sergeant majors talked about at the start of understanding people and acknowledging each and everyone's constraints. And we're not just trying to belt feed uh, to get everyone up to the same level. I hope, that, I hope that's clear. Corporal Sol, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think you touched really nicely on the points we raised about our, our shift and our change in battle rhythm. Um, I think what I'll add to this is then the, the points that a few people have mentioned in the Q&A about WhatsApp um, and Captain Russell, you said about communication as well. Uh, and my big key kind of takeaway um, from the, the whole kind of experience of leading in this kind of digital age is effective communication one of the things that we found works really well for us is just falling back on those military tools that we've all been taught before out in the field such as warning orders and o groups um, and actually extracting key information and, and not necessarily holding that to not let other people in, be informed on in it but holding it into a central place until we're then ready to disseminate that information down to everybody and this avoids then having those Charlie Charlie One WhatsApp groups being sent information on a Sunday night, Monday morning, when us as civilians as well have jobs to then focus on. So being really clear, not blurring those lines between our civilian and reserve lives, but at the same time, just in general, being really clear on our communication avenues. It's, it's all too easy for big messages to be sent down to everybody. But at the same time, it's then easy for, you know, troopers, lance corporals, uh, corporals and the like to then send messages all the way back up through that chain of command without necessarily going through the normal processes that we would have in barracks so effective communication for me is a really key one using using whatsapp for its benefits but then also utilizing other channels for their benefits as well uh, and i think zoom has been a good a, a good thing for us in that virtual domain uh, being able to formalize being able to give briefs going into breakout rooms uh, having that time in our troops um, that's, that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Uh, so that's, that's my real kind of key takeaway there is the, the effective communication with that as well. Brilliant. Uh, uh, moving on from that and, and, and slightly uh, uh, and continue with that theme is, is, you know, what best practices and top tips do we have in the use of social media? And we've already spoke about in the Army Sergeant Major in particular with a question that was asked uh, about fill your boots and, and how do we protect and ensure that the information that we're passing down down the chain of command it is correct, uh, you know, in light of uh, a recent report released that uh, young people now in the last six months have probably observed in and around uh, 200,000 fake news articles. And how do we ensure that we get truth 
uh, to all of our soldiers across all the ranks and across all organizations. And I'll probably bring in uh, Corporal Richardson to start us off with that question. Um, I think, so from my perspective, or from my perspective in the last two years, uh, dealing with the recruits anyway, I think the, the best way is just to be open and honest with recruits and be a pillar of, of information or be a filter for information. We can't stop the fake news and we can't stop recruits seeing fill your boots and all the rest of it. There's nothing wrong with them seeing fill your boots, but you need to be, or I found that you need to be approachable in the sense that you need to be, for a recruit to say, oh, I saw this on fill your boots. You know, granted, we've told them to stay off fill your boots, but the fact of the matter is they've seen it or they've seen it. For them to come to you and say, is this what it's like? Um, I think we need to be, again, open and honest to be able to say, this isn't what it's like. This is people, and as the Army Sat Major said earlier, there's a difference between moaning and complaining. And I think for me as a corporal, to be that filter to say, listen, this is just people moaning, or to say, listen, this is, yes, it might be an issue, but this is the way to go about it. So I think we can't stop it. We only have to embrace it. It's just all about being that filter, I think, for recruit, especially recruits who are very, uh, very um, can't think of the word, but yeah, they're very open to just absorb like sponges for information and to get loads of preconceived ideas about stuff. But again, just to reiterate the point, to be that filter, um, I hope that sort of answers the question. Uh, and I just want to bring in Captain McLaren Stewart uh, and Corporal Ross um, from Five Medreg, bearing in mind that you know Corporal Ross is currently deployed on Op Rescript here in London. Uh, and how you know you see the, the, the effects of social media and fake news, uh, and how do we protect and protect our force uh, against that and ensure that the correct messaging is going out? Because uh, uh, you see at the end the, you know the end results and effects of of, of the current pandemic uh, at the forefront of um, of every, all the work that you're doing at the minute. Yeah, I think Corporal Richardson's raised some really good points there. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to sort of hide away from all the fake news that's out there. Um, our soldiers will see them, they will absorb it. And Corporal Richardson did raise a really good point. And the best way for us to deal with it is just to be open and honest with our responses. You know, if they see something and come ask us questions about it, that needs to be encouraged. We need to be able to happily explain our thought processes. So that if they do come to us with questions, we can sit back and give them honest answers about why things have happened. Or if they've seen something that isn't true, we can explain, you know, what the truth of the situation is. Excellent. So, uh, and just continuing on, um, you know, from a, from a medical perspective and, and, and the deployment and uh, the deployment of medics across, across the country to support the MACA tasks, you know, how well prepared did you feel stepping, stepping in and working with external agencies such as the NHS? You know, how comfortable did you feel operating and leading detached from the chain of command in a dispersed environment? And did, did that give an element of ownership or, or you know, did you feel prepared, trained correctly? Or, or was there an element of kind of like nervousness and that we could have been better prepared? And how do we go about ensuring that we are prepared for the future? So, um, you, you couldn't fully prepare yourself for, for going into a COVID ward where everyone's intubated and you're, you're looking at basically, you're looking at machines you've never seen before. Um, and even if you could, you've done lessons over Zoom or whatever on these machines, you're not going to fully understand them until you see them. Um, and then you're not going to fully understand what you're getting yourself into until you go in there. We were quite lucky, like I said earlier on my little speech, that we, um, we did have training about various aspects of what... So we had a, a picture of what we're going to walk into, which helped. So Because I think if I, if I hadn't ever had any idea of what I was walking into, yeah, I, um, I, I probably would have to stand and take five minutes. Um, to answer your question, you can't fully prep yourself for it. If that makes sense. We're, we're learning on the job and the NHS are amazing. So we, we've got a, an ITU nurse working with each and every one of us. So we'll get tasked off to one of them and they'll, they'll explain exactly what they need us to do. And then over the subsequent weeks of working on the shifts, after, after a 12 and a half hour shift, you, you pretty much know what they expect of you. And then you're just doing that again and again and again. So yeah, as we go on, we're getting smoother, we're getting quicker, we're getting faster, and and they're they're teaching us as we go along. But you, you can't really prep for it. Um, I'd just say, yeah, be safe, don't get COVID. Really, you don't want that. Yeah. So. Thank you, Ross. Yeah.
Um, we spoke um, earlier, it was, it was spoken about challenge and about challenging up. Uh, and particularly, uh, you know, in a hierarchical organisation such as the army, uh, that can be quite difficult to do. Uh, but what I would want to point out uh, is, is in a reserve space, and it's been mentioned before, people can vote with their feet and, and they can walk out and not return if they wish to. Uh, so the question really I want to put to uh, Lieutenant Donna and Court Seal is, you know, how do you deal with challenge? And how do you balance and equate uh, experience against the rank that people hold within the reserve forces? And how do you move forward to make that into a collaborative team that works with trust and mission command? Lieutenant Darlington. Thank you. Um, I just want to get this right. I think it's a problem we come up against all the time. And you see it, you can see it in varying degrees at every level of rank. Now, the, 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 the effect is ultimately someone doesn't show up. Maybe higher up in rank, they will have communicated that proactively but it still leaves you on the day without a person filling that role that you require them in. Um, maybe at a lower rank, they just don't show up. Not, that's not a rule of thumb. That's just generally from my experience. And, and I think this is when I, you know, in my, in the brief earlier, it's really about as, as junior leadership and, and all leaders actually within the reserves and, and I believe regulars when, when you're interacting with reserves, that tact and approach of how you go about a problem is, and, 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 talking to, to confronting this issue is really key. And it's knowing, using those soft, soft leadership skills, knowing when is too far to push. Because if you push too hard, we just lose that soldier. And we lose all of the time we've invested in it and all of the, 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 the benefit that we can have in the future. Now that said, there are still times where we are in the army and if you commit to something, you will be made to do it, right? because we've put time and effort. And if you're, if you're going to go on, if you're deploying on operations, that is going to happen. That process will carry that through. So it's just knowing the battles to fight and have it a, a prime example that has stayed with me um, since I first commissioned is I had a, we had a CPX one weekend and I had a corporal, a Lance Corporal, who's a, um, a scaffolder in London. And we really needed him to come on the CPX because he, he had some SIG calls and we needed him to man one of the radios. And, and actually, he called me Friday evening and said, boss, I've been offered overtime in London on, on this job. Like the money, not to quote it, but it was, it was to a point that it would have been absolutely ridiculous for him to turn down that work and come away with the Army Reserves for 50, 60, 70 quid, whatever he makes a day. And it's knowing those moments to say, yeah, do you know what? You are going to leave us in the lurch, but actually we're supportive of you and, and, and outside of it. So I think for me, it's really just using those soft skills to, to take every single occasion as it comes, rather than taking a blanket approach of, you said you're going to do it, make it happen. Cool. So do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think you really touched on the, the kind of welfare aspects to that and knowing our individual soldiers. Um, and one of the things we spoke about in our talk was the encouraging values and standards. And, and for me, this is quite a pertinent one, uh, one that I, I feel quite strongly about, having been in reservists now for over 10 years. Um, I mentioned in the, in the talk that as a traditional army reservist, one of the problems that we actually face constantly is choice. And every day when we put our uniform on to come in, on a parade night or a weekend or whether we're helping out in operations we, we volunteer every single day that we do that because it's not a normal job it's not a normal routine so encouraging the values and standards of, th of things like selfless commitment is is a really fine line to tread and quite quite tricky to do sometimes and understanding those individuals like lieutenant don said can sometimes really win the battle overall as opposed to trying to nitpick at the tiny little details so for me selfless commitment and encouraging those values and standards um, from a ground level up is really important in this in, in this instance and making and the flip side to that is then making people aware that actually we should be proud to them wear this uniform and 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 take part in this one army concept and really feel that sense of duty to then actually do things that we've volunteered um, to say that we are happy to do so making people aware that they do have a sense of duty, but then also at the same time understanding what's important and what's not um, is one of those kind of arts, I suppose, of leadership that can be quite tricky to do. 
knowing the people, but also understanding the, the line that we have to toe and, and seeing the realities of that, I think is really important. So yeah, for me, I think the point on that is encouraging those values and standards and having that sense of duty um, and understand that we put that uniform every on every day as a volunteer, I think is quite important. Um, and I think that's how I'll answer that one. Thank you. Thank you, Court Seal. Uh, just to finish off with one, uh, one final question, uh, Zoom fatigue, uh, and the irony is not lost to me that uh, this conference is being brought to you via Zoom uh, for the majority of this morning. Uh, it's becoming a big issue in regards to retention and, and how we train and, and, and utilize our force as we move forward. What, uh, what three ways uh, would you encourage units uh, within the military as we move out of the pandemic uh, to use this form of uh, technology uh, to combat fatigue whilst doing training from home. And I'm going to start with Corporal Richardson uh, from ITC Catrick. Um, I think fortunately we, we haven't experienced, especially at Catrick, uh, we haven't experienced too much Zoom fatigue. Uh, we did work from home for a while, so early, so if we were talking first lockdown time. Uh, fortunately there wasn't a lot of distance learning going on with recruits. Um, there, was, there was still a handful of platoons, but it's relatively short. We went back into training in May. Uh, so the, it was, whilst Zoom was sort of new, uh, we didn't really um, have time really to get that Zoom fatigue. Moving from May uh, to today, we've, we've been you know, pretty much working as we, as we have been at full capacity. Um, but in terms of everything else, again, I'm on the other side of the fence. I've not, I've not experienced Zoom fatigue. I've used it as and when necessary, but I've not been overloaded with it. And it's, for me anyway, it's been a, it's been a perfect tool. Uh, so it's probably not the answer you wanted or the answer of what people wanted, but you know, I'm still a big, uh, a big fan of Zoom, but again, I've not experienced that, that sort of Zoom fatigue. Uh, and just to finalise, uh, Captain McLaren Stewart, if we can get your, your views. Yeah, again, I think my views are, are largely similar to Corporal Richardson's there. Actually, for the whole time that we've been, you know, working from home and working remotely, we did rely on Zoom, absolutely, but at no point do I think it really got that overbearing. Um, in the first couple of weeks, we all got a bit excited and, you know, made everything via Zoom. But, you know, SHQ and our, so our squadron headquarters sat down a while later and actually tried to figure out what training actually needed to take place versus what we could just delay until everyone got back into, squad, into squadron. Um, and actually, the way we ended up doing it was most of the stuff we did on Zoom was actually sort of quite low level training. So you know, never more than sort of 15 to 20 people. And we were using our specialists or our doctors and our nurses to deliver lessons that the guys wanted to learn. So one of the great things about being in the med corps is that all of the medics are really, really keen about medicine. Um, and they're, they're just so keen to get their hands on anything they can do that helps them learn more about it. So we were able to effectively use Zoom to a way that would suit the medics and to be able to teach them stuff that we wouldn't necessarily get around to doing in squadron. Um, but actually in the last couple of months, you know, there hasn't been that much. We were back in work at the end of the last year. And then as soon as Christmas was over, all the guys were sent straight off to the hospitals. So, yeah, again, I don't, I don't think we've experienced too much Zoom fatigue. But I think if you were experiencing it, the best way to deal with it would just be to prioritise. Think what training is, you know, really vital to get done and what can wait. And how can you make that training relevant to the training audience? What do they want to know? And how can you best teach it? Uh, and finally, uh, and probably most effective, uh, Corporal Seal. Uh, the, the Zoom fatigue is, uh, is definitely one that's rife um, within the reserve concept, uh, it's especially for a lot of us. We work online during the day with our civilian jobs. And then coming onto Zoom um, for an evening parade session, it, yeah, it can definitely be fatiguing. This is something that we've had to really, really battle with. Um, uh, as a squadron and try to come up with some innovative ways around it. I think one example that I'll, I'll kind of highlight here is um, we always talk about it going back to basics and for a lot of the time going back to basics can be our, our soldier first syllabus or, or maybe just going in and doing maths. Um, but then if you really, really distill it down, um, just simple things like phys um, physical fitness, navigation, um, these are things that actually we can get our soldiers out and about doing uh, without necessarily having to be on Zoom. Uh, one of the things that we're currently running within the squadron is a fitness competition, see who can track up the most mileage within the troop. Uh, and all we ask is a, a Strava or a Garmin kind of update 
uh, and maybe a selfie whilst they're out on the route as well. Uh, and this is nice ways to really engage with our teams, uh, but at the same time, not having to worry about being online at the same time and getting people outdoors. Um, and that, that's something that's been working quite well for us so far this month. Thank you, sir. Brilliant. So uh, I just want to uh, conclude that session now uh, as we move into a, another five minute break uh, for comfort. Uh, sorry, wrong. Ten minute break for comfort. Um, but I just want to uh, say thank you to all of our presenters that have joined us today and particularly for those who are deployed on macro operations or have taken time out of their training programs and plans uh, to join us and, and give their perspectives from a junior, junior leader's uh, point of view. I'm sure you can take these lessons away and put them into practice. I'm sure some of you are already experiencing some of these issues that you're dealing with on a daily basis and, and trying to comp plan for when we return back to some form of normality in the future. Hello, hi, and welcome to our last session of the day. It is a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm Dr. Linda Risso, and I'm the new senior researcher at the Center for Army Leadership. What we're going to do today uh, in this session is actually to have three speakers, but the session is divided into two. We first will be discussing leadership in sport with Jill Scott, and uh, we will have then a Q&A session with her. Then we will move on, on to uh, leadership in business with Hayden Brooks and Max Buchanan. So let me start by saying uh, that it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Jill Scott, who is currently the midfielder at Everton from on loan from Manchester City. She is an impressive midfielder and an inspiration to a whole generation of new young female footballers. At this very moment, there are plenty of young girls practicing their kick-ups in the back gardens, looking forward to uh, you know, re 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 taking up their training again. And I have to say that Jill Scott has been pivotal in inspiring them. So without my far much further ado, I leave the floor to Jill Scott and we start first with a video I think Twitter, I think it's really helped the women's game because if this game can keep growing at the speed that it has, then it can reach all kinds of new heights. Whenever I pull that England shirt on, I never take the next game for granted. That dream of being a professional footballer that's real, it exists. It could be my last major tournament. I just know that I'm ready to go out there and give it my absolute all. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to say a big hello, firstly, and it's such an honour to be here speaking to you all. Um, I think when I first thought about, obviously, <clears throat> coming and talking, I was like, what about if there's no football fans? And they're like, who's Jill Scott? So I thought, what kind of comparisons can I can I draw to? Um, and I think one of them was seeing how you all have gone on to represent the army in different jobs and stuff like that. It shows how driven and committed that you all are. And I suppose when I look at myself, I would say that them are two things that drive me every single day. And I suppose when you were young, you probably just had a, a big heart and wanted to represent one of the biggest organisations in the world. And I suppose that was me, a young Jill, a big heart, a love for football, and just wanted to go on to represent England. There was a lot of lessons to be learned along the way, and that's probably something I'm gonna, gonna touch on in my presentation. I don't know, is my presentation getting shared on the screen, if that's okay? Yes. Yes. I just can't see it at the minute. It's okay, I can start. If you just wanna click through the slides, and um, the next slide, that's fine. You'll realise in this presentation that I'm not very good with technology. Um, so if you just want to go to the next one, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So the next slide should be about lessons learned along the way. So when I first started playing for England, we had a manager called Hope Powell and 
I was about age 18, I think. And I remember I saying to me, Jill, you've got to be obsessed. You've got to be crazy. If you want to reach the top, <clears throat> you have to have this, this mindset that just makes you obsessed every single day. And I was an 18 year old girl and I was thinking obsessed. Who, who gets obsessed with things? I, I just want to play football. But I think without even realising it, I did become obsessed because every single day um, was football all the time. Everything I was eating, I was thinking, am I doing the right thing? Because we've got a big game on a Sunday. And I think throughout the years, although I didn't realise, I was becoming obsessed. Um, if you just click the next slide, please. So there was lots of times when you're younger, and I'm sure you can relate that people will always say to you as an experienced person, they'll say, well, when I was your age and when I was in your shoes, they'd say, this is what I did. And I think when you're younger, you don't tend to listen to that advice because you need to go through it yourself sometimes. And I know that was definitely something that I needed to do. So now when I'm coaching younger players, I don't go to them oh, you should do this and you should do that. I think sometimes they have to go through it themselves. So, for example, on a Friday night when I was younger, I might have had a McDonald's and then I'd have gone training on a Saturday and probably felt absolutely like rubbish. And then I thought the next week, well, I'm not going to do that because I felt terrible. So I think that was one thing that I, that I learned early on, that although people can dictate to you and tell you things, sometimes you have to experience your own journey. Um, and that's one of the things that I hang my hat on now. I think everybody's journey is different. You can't look to the person to the left of you and think, oh, well, they do this, so I need to be doing that. I've got a lot of you will know Steph Holt, an England captain, and we played together since the age of 12. And we are the most different people you'll ever meet. So I probably don't sit and look at my analysis all the time. I, I need a day, a day away from football because uh, that's what works for me. But she's very, she'll analyse everything. Um, she'll obviously be working hard every single day, which we both do, but she's totally different personalities. But my point being that if you want to get somewhere, you can still get somewhere, but you don't have to do exactly the same thing as the person next to you. I think personality is, is a massive thing. Um, and as long as you keep bringing your personality and being true to yourself, then you can go on to, to achieve whatever you want to achieve. If you can go on to, you might just have to skip a few uh, slides now, if you don't mind. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, that's fine. So I think uh, along with my lessons learned, obviously I've got their judge on performance, not the end result and to stick to the process. So that picture is actually taken 2019 against America semi-final. I got smacked in the face a few times, hence hence the black eye. Um, and I think in that moment, it was a it was a high challenge game, obviously semi-final, a chance to reach a final of the World Cup. And we, we had to stick to the process. It was one of them where emotion, suddenly you need to win, you need to get to that final. And we probably didn't do it as, as well as we should have. Um, and we ended up getting beat, hence why I look so moody and angry. But... I think that was one thing I definitely learned early on that no matter what's happening, all that noise around you, everything that's going on, your training that you do every single day, you have to stick to the process all the time. And, and that was one thing. Always try and stay logical. Don't let the emotion get, get in the way. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons that I've probably gone on to, to be successful in football because I can kind of like differentiate between the logic and the emotion sometimes. Um, if you just go on to the next one, I always get told off for this next slide. So skip again, please. So goals, I don't set long term goals. And when I say this, all the coaches out there look at us and say, oh, don't say that younger people they should be setting goals all the time. But I think this goes back to, to what I said before about being your own person and, and what works for you. So I'm definitely a person that's so in the moment. I wake up on the morning. I know what training I've got to get done. And I always think if I can look myself in the eye at the end of the day and say, you know what, Jill, you worked hard today, then the next day I can just kind of reset and, and go again. And that's how I think. And that's what's worked for me. I'm not saying that's going to work for everyone. As I say, there's girls on my team that have probably got a 10-year plan where they want to go to a World Cup, they want to go to a Euros, they want to go to an Olympics. And that's what works for them. So there I've just touched on, obviously, everyday goals. 
these pictures on the slide I've had a bit of makeup put on on them so I don't look like this usually uh, but yeah everyday goals so just just them little things I used to always think there'd be some days that I would wake up and I'd be like oh, I can't be bothered with training today and I'm I'm sure everyone has them feelings and that's fine that's okay but the one thing that used to keep us motivated was the person that wants to be playing for Manchester City, wants to be playing for Everton, wants to be representing England. They'll be going out today in the snow, in the cold, and they'll be doing the hard work and getting a step ahead of you. And I think that was one thing I always try to like hang my hat on. And then I've just touched on in that last bullet point, I was just saying about being a good person. This is definitely something my hero growing up, um, I loved him because he was a very good looking man, David Beckham, but also because of how he was off the pitch. Um, he always had time for people. And I always had a saying in my head that was aim to inspire before you expire. So one day nobody will want a photo with you. Nobody will want an autograph. And I think just I want to take advantage of kind of being a role model and trying to set an example to the younger generation. So I think being a good person, it's so important because when you're in them high challenging situations and I can see I've been in massive games and I've looked to the person to the left of us and I've thought you know what I I remember she did this for me or she supported me in in this it might have been like an off the field situation and I was like I'm going to go the extra mile for her today I really am and I think when um there's a story actually it was 2000 I'm going to start showing my age when I start reflecting on dates but 2009 I got dropped for a quarter final of a European Championships and I was devastated. I, I remember it was one of them moments, you know, when you can't stop the tears, but you really don't want to cry because you're like, I'm strong and I'm not that person. But I ran into one of my teammates outside and it was uh, Karen Carney. And we'd been teammates for probably four or five years. We, we weren't best of friends, but we were good teammates. Um, and she was just there for us in that moment. She asked how I was. She checked in with us. And from that day moving forward, we actually became best, best of friends. And I'm not saying you have to be best of friends with everyone, but I think just sometimes looking to the person to the left of you and saying, oh, are you OK today? Or checking in with them. I think it goes so far, like, I know everybody's guilty of it nowadays, but being on our phones and I think sometimes we try to stay off our phones in the changing rooms because before a game, you might have someone who's nervous, not necessarily young, but just I get nervous still now. And obviously I'm like 34, which is definitely telling you my age. But um, I think them moments can be so important going into a game. So I think let's try and stay off our phones and just check in with people a little bit more regular. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So be the best you can be. It's probably a bit of an obvious, obvious statement. Um, and the next one, please. So I've put in here about um, how do you know kind of what, what your best is. And the reason I say that is because sometimes people put a bit of a ceiling on you. So they say to you, this is what you're good at. Th this is what you can do. And you start to believe it a bit now. In my time, I've been in different environments and I probably thought of myself as a maybe a short passing midfielder, uh, box to box, and I believe that them are my strengths. But I think when you sometimes you change environments and then someone kind of says, you know what, Jill, you can play a long ball and you can do this and you start to believe it. I think don't put a ceiling on what your best can be. Like really believe that if the person next to you can do something, then why can't you do it? So I'd, I wanted to touch on that because that's probably something where I think sometimes you get boxed into what you're good at, but I think you can be good at a whole whole range of things. And touching on influences, I think it's so important that you surround yourself with the right people. So we all have good friends within our organisation, but what do you class a good friend as? Because I know there's times where if I said, oh, I'm not playing on Sunday, I wouldn't want my friend to be saying, oh, well, you should be playing. You know what? You're a great player. You're this, you're that. I just wouldn't want them to be doing that. And my good friends will probably turn around and say, well, you know what, Jill, just keep working hard. Stick to the process. OK, he's given the opportunity to someone else, but it's really not that big a deal. And I think that high challenge, but with high support is so important. And one of my best friends, Jennifer Beatty, I'll sometimes go to our with, with things and it might just be random topics, but she never just says to us, yeah, Jill, you're right. She always challenges us and asks us questions. And 
I think that's what's going to make you better as a person. Um, so, yeah, I think who you surround yourself with is, is so important. And then also, I've also put just in there, like, your drivers, like, what drives you? So, say, in lockdown, I remember the first lockdown we got uh, about six weeks off football. We're still at a train, but the first week we'd been so full on. It was so nice just to relax. And then I started to miss it a little bit. But you know what? I went outside with a football and I was just having to kick about, doing keep me ups. Like I was going to say doing loads of tricks, but I'm, I'm not that good. But just remembering why I loved football, football in the first place. And one of my biggest drivers is my, my family, making them proud. Um, a lot of people will say to us, well, you should be proud of, of what you've achieved. And and I am, obviously, I, I, am, I am proud. But I think when it's your job, you just kind of, go through each day you get your work done and then when people go to us wow you've won 149 England caps now and I'll I'll reply I'm like slightly embarrassed sometimes I'm like oh it's just because I'm getting old or try and kind of like deflect the comment but I think that's just the, just the person that I am and I know when I finish playing I, I will be proud of the journey that I've had but I never forget my driver which is my family and, and making them proud so uh, next slide please thank you yeah, these are just quotes. I do love a good quote, to be honest. So um, determination with an optimistic attitude is the key to success. And I like that quote because you can be the most talented person ever. Uh, when I was 14, I went to an England camp and I was the worst player there. There was probably 30 of us came home in tears and I wasn't good enough. And I think at that moment I could have decided, you know what, Jill, you're not good enough. Just maybe look to do something else. But I worked so hard. And now I look at that squad of 30 and there's probably only five that actually went on to represent England. And I was one of them. I didn't get selected again till I was 18, but you have to have the right attitude. You have to. I touched on before you miss a session, someone else is gaining yards on you. And I think that's like anything in life. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so having, having no regrets, not letting myself down. I think that's when I touched on before looking in the mirror, no shortcuts. I always think, you know what, we can all want want these like massive goals of where we want to be and what we want to do. Um, but I think at, at the end of the day, you, you have to you have to work hard and think. I think some people won't go on to make it, which is what I sometimes tell younger kids. I'm like, okay, everybody's not going to go on to represent the country. But as long as you've given it your absolute everything, I never want to be that person that looks in the mirror and says, oh, I wish I'd done that or I'd, I regret this and I, I regret that. I think if you do everything you possibly can, I think then you can you can be proud of it and you might not get to where you want to get to, but you might get there in five years time, 10 years time. And I think that's one thing that's that's very important that you just kind of keep going. I put there, make them need you even if they don't want you in. Okay, this is something you can relate to football, but I'm sure you can relate it to work as well. You might, I've had different managers over the years. Some of them have ended up being uh, very good friends of mine. But then there's some that will probably just had a working relationship. Um, and I felt to myself sometimes with, um, not all of them, but a limited number, I'm like, oh, if... Um, I'm like, they don't like me or they don't want us to play and stuff. But I'm like, Jill, if you think they don't want you, make them need you. And that means becoming, for me, it was the, the best midfielder I can be. And they look to pick the team and they're like, we need Jill in there today. We, we need her um, to go on there and give us a performance. So that's one quote that I really do like. And then resilience. This is one that I've, I've actually toyed with over the years. So I touched on before that. Um, I'm obviously 34 now and I work with 17, 18 year olds. So that's literally half, half my age. And I'd always, I'm doing hand signals, but you, you can't see us, but basically like staying on a line, like when things are going well, not getting myself too high. And then when things are going bad, it means I'm not having this massive drop and feeling terrible. So I do like to put that one in, but then I have found with the youth over the years that, I, sometimes I want them to show a bit of motion so we'll win an FA Cup and it is usually our younger players I'm like go and enjoy it you've just won an FA Cup like this is such a great moment and I kind of want them to show that emotion 
So I think it's finding a balance really, like enjoy your successes because you put so much work into it that if you don't enjoy your successes, what's what's the point in it? And um, but at the same time, don't get too low if if you've had a bad day. Think there's another day tomorrow. Maybe make a little plan. It might be a day plan, um, and that's kind of like what's what's worked for me over the years. And then I think just touching on when I said to you about we're obviously in a squad with a lot of different ages, a lot of different backgrounds, and I think what's so important is that everybody <clears throat> has their own journey. And I think I always look at our team as our fuel tank, and I'm like I have to be respectful that they haven't had the same journey as me. So values morals opinions might be different but there was a point where I thought we were kind of like battling against each other I was like no we're right we used to do that and then they're like well it didn't work for you because you didn't win and we kind of had to meet halfway and be like right we need a plan that we're, we're all believing and this can become uh, our driving force every single day we believe that if we do x y and z then we're going to go on to to win and as I said before stick to the process but I think make sure your fuel tank is listening to everybody's journey and think about all the different experiences people have had <clears throat> and I think it's just it's so important that that would do that and you you see that as a as a positive with within your team and taking the time out to get to know people sometimes you'll judge people uh, without even having a conversation with them but if you speak to them you might have more in common than you actually think you probably wouldn't be working in the same environment with no similarities whatsoever so I think that is an important one that will really will love having diversity and people being different in different journeys different stories but at the same time we don't hold it against them because they've got different journeys and different stories and we try to understand where they've come from as well. Um, I've just realised I've got a spelling mistake there, staying determined, and I usually am very good with my spelling. So I don't think I wrote this slide, so I'm going to pass the book on that one. Um, right, the last one, what's what's the worst that's going to happen? So obviously this is a difficult one for me to to kind of talk about to everyone, but in a, in a football sense, I'm like, what's the worst that's going to happen? We're going to lose a game okay it's it's not the end of the world and then you move on to kind of kind of the next one so it's it's almost like when the worst thing doesn't fear you you kind of just you you get like a little bit bigger in your shoulders and you're like a little bit more come on then like I'm not scared of the worst so kind of let's be having your type thing um, and then if you just go on to the next couple of slides please uh, and the next one please so yeah keeping a positive mindset so I feel like these things are a little bit generic and I, I don't I don't want them to be generic, but I think I am a very positive person. Don't get us wrong, there was I, I don't mind sharing this, but um probably last season I probably wasn't uh too happy in, in some ways. And it's hard when you're expected to be the the joker and the one that's making everybody laugh all the time, but inside you're probably not really feeling it. And I felt like even though I was still doing it because I wanted to be a good team player. I didn't want to be that person that let everybody else down. Um, but it was really draining us of energy because I was trying to be someone that I probably wasn't feeling like I wanted to be that day. I hope that makes sense. Um, and I think that touches on a little bit of what I said before about being your own person. You don't have to be like everybody else. So don't drain yourself um, trying to be like harder and tougher on people. If it's not you, call on your teammates and be like, you know what, I need you to do that for me today because that's you. And then I think if you all add together your values, then you can have the most amazing team ever. But just say, like, that's not me, so I'm going to use you. That's why you're in a team. It's, it shouldn't all be down to you. Um, so, yeah, that was probably me, probably feeling a little bit drained. and um, But at the same time, I think it's important that you find somebody, especially in, in your squad or your team or in your work, that you can talk to and, and tell them really how you're feeling and just kind of lean on them a little bit, but make sure you're doing the same for the person next to you. So yeah, that's about kind of finding the good in situations. Um, obviously COVID at the minute, it's hard to stay positive. And I think touching on not setting long-term goals, it's probably a good thing at the minute because there's so much uncertainty around everything in the world. But I was talking to some uh, younger players the other day and I said, you know what, even if you have a sheet of paper 
and you say, right, today I need to do a 5K run, I need to revise for an exam, and I need to do, I don't know, the washing or something. I know it sounds stupid, but it's just three things. You go through them in the day, right, okay, done. And then you have a sense of fulfilment going into the next day. And I think that's something that helps me when I write it on a piece of paper. It's like, Jill, you've got to do it. Thank you, Jill. Very good. And very interesting comments about how to build and to maintain resilience. And particularly, I think it's very helpful, your comments on how to be a role model on the pitch as well as outside, which is really the characteristic of a real leader. We have plenty of good questions coming in. Um, one of them is to group all of them together is about diversity and inclusion in sport. So people are asking about your own perspective and your own experience. And if you have faced any resistance regarding diversity and in sport and what methods or systems are in place for those in leadership to promote diversity or what should be put in place, if you think. Uh, yeah, I think obviously in, in football, there's, there's times in which we've had a lot of challenge, especially about women can't play football and because it's something different, isn't it? I think it's always been male footballers over the years. So when I first started out, like when I was younger, I, I'm not afraid to say it, but I did used to get bullied for playing football because it was one girl and like 20 boys. And they were like, why does this girl want to play football? And the parents used to, I was only nine years old and the parents would be like, break our legs, kick her. And I suppose that was like a, a diversity issue because it was not everyone's the same and it was something different. But I think one thing that in myself, I, I always wanted to play football all the time. And I think the parents were probably more of a problem. The, the boys would include me and kind of have that inclusion. And then now I fast forward, obviously, 34 minus 9, 25, 25 years. I haven't done maths for a while. Um, and there's so many young girls now that have opportunity to go and play for football teams. Um, and it makes us so happy. Like I did a, I did a football soccer camp the, the other week. And usually it would be when I was younger, like 50 boys and about three girls. And I think now we'll get 75 girls. So I think there is things in place, definitely. As I said before, I love that um, everybody's different. I love uh, inclusion, diversity. I think, as I touched on before, everyone's journey is different, but make the most of that. Have conversations, ask people things. And as I said, that can become your, your fuel tank. How boring would the world be if everybody was the same? And I think that's something that um, I, that makes the world such a, such a great place at times. So, yeah, I think I've probably gone through a few diversity um, issues, but then at the same time, I think we've come through the other side as well. Question: uh, Which captain or coach was the best role model for you during your playing career, and what characteristics or attributes did they have that really inspired you? Oh, that's a good question. I think I've had um, I've had a few different managers, and I think the the law bring different qualities. So say back in the day, which is going back about 15 years, I had Mo Marley, who she was, there was no money involved in the game or anything. She just did it through the love of the game. It was actually at Everton when I first started out. So my journey went Everton seven years, Manchester City seven years, and now I'm back here on loan. Hence why I've got to run out and train straight after this. But um, yeah, and she was just, she really kind of drilled into us like morals and values. She didn't do anything for money. She, she would wash the kit herself, but she almost like fabricated our journeys a little bit as well, which gave us this strong mindset. So when I was playing for England under 19s, I remember I felt like I'd had a good tournament and it got to the final and she left us out. And I was like, oh, I was devastated. And after the trip, she said to us, do you know why I left you out? And I was like, no, because I thought I was doing okay. And she was like, because I needed to see how you reacted because tomorrow you're joining up with the first team. And I was like, it was so clever of her to do that because if I'd showed a bad attitude, I couldn't go on to represent England at the highest level. So yeah, I think she was very good um, at, as I say, fabricating journeys. And then I've had managers who have probably become my friends. And then I've had managers who would don't speak now, but I'm still... Uh, I'm very kind of grateful for the opportunity that the, the givers and how they pushed us on. So I think that goes back to my point of not everybody has to be your best friend, um, but they can still add value to your life. Thank you very much. 
our viewers are picking on my introduction when I said that you are inspiring a generation of young girls and they're wondering about your views uh, on visibility of different groups and how much this is actually an inspiring element uh, for young people. Um, in terms of like inspiring boys and girls, do you mean? Yes. Yeah. So it's actually, it's, it's a very good question because when I touched on the soccer camps, when I first started doing them, um, it's girls football and the, the reason I did that was because um, I had a lot of girls coming to me at the time and they were very low on confidence and I was running these girl camps and it just gave them a lift because they were around girls that were similar and they kind of got a lot of confidence from it but I have had a lot of requests to do some, uh, I have coached boys before and I, I do want to do the soccer camps for boys as well because I had a conversation not that long ago and I was like I can't say, say to people, including um, the talk about diversity and stuff like that. And then I limit my soccer camps to girls, but it was just kind of building the confidence up a little bit. But yeah, it's a great point. And it's definitely something that I'm going to do in the future. And the fact that these young boys are like, oh, we want to come to your soccer camp. Um, that like means so much to me because I think they are looking up seeing female footballers. And we had some messages in the last World Cup and it was like, oh, my son's just got a football shirt with Lucy Bronze's name on and that was just so pleasing to see because them are the moments that shows how far the game has actually come. Yeah. And what do you think about the future of women's football? And do you think that, if at all, the stigma has now disappeared uh, completely? I don't think it'll ever disappear, to be honest. You still get the, the odd messages and stuff like that, but... I think that's like anything you do. Uh, always remember that people want you to do well, but they never want you to do better than them. And I think that's like, that's a good point. I feel like there's so many people on Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that. I'm, I don't mean everybody doesn't want you to do better than them, but a lot of people um, will probably hit you with like jealous comments and stuff like that. But I don't tend to look at Twitter and Instagram. I do feel sorry for the younger generation a little bit because that's kind of the world that we're living now. And, I'm at the point where I can play a game. I don't even go on Twitter. I'm like, if Bob from Ipswich says I've had a good game, it, it doesn't make any difference to us. And the same as if Bill says, Jill, you are absolutely rubbish today. The only people that matter are my coaches because I know that they're telling us to play a certain way um, and the people within my organisation because all these people on the outside, they don't know the information you've been given. They haven't seen you training all week. And I think that's kind of one of the things that I've, I feel like I'm quite good at, like staying away from social media. And I think like the younger generation, they're under such a, um, such pressures to, to look a certain way and be a certain way and be a certain person. Like, I think for me, like even when I'm training and stuff, some of the photos that come back of us, I look, I look absolutely terrible, but I'm like, that's me working hard. And that's, that's like my good photo. But I do, I do feel sorry for the younger generation in that sense. But I think, remember, you don't have to read things. It's your mobile phone. You can get off it when you want. And always remember, you're in control. These people that can message you, but you don't have to look at them. So, yeah, I think that's, um, that's a good point around, around social media of today. Thank you very much. Very helpful advice there. One last, I think, very difficult question is how did you personally deal with difficult team dynamics? For example, when someone in the team doesn't get along very well with you and how can you still maintain team functionality and professionalism? Yeah, I've been, I've been in teams where probably haven't got along. There's been times when there's probably been two people just don't get along at all. Um, and I'm not going to lie, it's, it's very difficult, very difficult. And it's something that if it can be resolved as soon as possible, you don't want it to rot in your environment. And I look at it as like a little bit of bacteria to begin with, and then you leave it and then it just starts infecting the whole culture and the whole environment. So I think firstly, my lessons from that would be nip it in the bud straight away, whether it's a conversation with that person. Okay, we're not going to be best of friends, but we both want to win for this team. We both have the same goals. How can we make that happen? Um, and I think, yeah, they're, they're, there's probably been times when it's been the most difficult time of my career where, because I'm such a person that thrives off the off the pitch environment, when that's not going well, 
it can really get us down. But yeah, I think just try and try and have that conversation because it's not worth all the wasted energy when you see that person and if they've been saying this about us and all that overthinking. All that overthinking could be going to the greater good of your environment and getting yourselves to a to a good level and and stuff like that. So yeah, that was a that was a really good question because it does happen. It does happen if you think put. 30 random people in a the room they're all not going to get on uh, that's that's just life so yeah good question thank you very much Jill this was our last question and uh, we would like to thank you very much for your wonderful insight and for your advice about how to deal with mm -hmm. social media and to build resilience we know that you have a demanding training session waiting for you and we are happy to let you go have a good training session okay. thank you very much thanks everyone enjoy the rest of your day and now we move swiftly on to the next part of our panel, which is about leadership in business. We have two speakers. They will each of give a presentation and we have a joint Q&A session at the end. The first speaker is Hayden Brooks, who is the CEO of Risk Ledger. He's a, a big for cyber risk consultant by trade and specializes in supply chain security. His company, Risk Ledger, is a technology platform that combines security governance platform with security social network. He's a very successful businessman and is listed as Forbes European 30, 30 under 30 in 2018. He's the winner of the 2018 Cyber Dan Awards sponsored by the UK government's National Cyber Security Center. And is the winner of the 2018 Most Innovative Cyber Company Award sponsored by Tech UK. Hayden, I leave the floor to you. Hi everyone. Uh, nice to be here and nice to see so many people in attendance. Uh, to come fully clean, I was assuming that this was going to be kind of a talk to 30 or 40 people, not 2,000, so I might be a little unprepared. Uh, and I don't actually have any slides on me, so you've got uh, me for the next kind of 10 or 15 minutes staring at you, uh, so strap in. Um, but yeah, what I thought I'd do is give a brief introduction onto myself, talk a bit about kind of my journey with my tech startup and Risk Ledger, uh, and kind of how uh, we've built a team there and, and what we look for in building a team. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about kind of some of the the kind of core three principles of leadership that, that we think about within the team um, and more importantly how they've changed over the past couple of years um, particularly last year with with the move to remote working um, and a move to the more digital age um, but to kick off yeah so my name is Hayden Brooks I'm the CEO of a tech startup called Risk Ledger uh, I'm 27 if you go back seven years I actually studied biomedical science at university specialized in uh, neuroscience uh, and I left and then ended up taking a job with KPMG, who are a quite a large consultancy, where I joined them as a cyber risk consultant. Um, and a cyber risk consultant essentially um, looks at the security of organizations, more from an IT security point of view, but also touches a bit on physical security. And we typically look at kind of uh, the risks that clients face and, and how we can help those clients kind of mitigate those risks. Uh, so I joined KPMG and spent about two years there as a cyber risk consultant, then headed over to Deloitte before moving to a startup myself. Um, and then after working at that startup for a couple of years, I then founded Risk Ledger. And Risk Ledger is a tech, tech platform that essentially allows companies to measure and mitigate supply chain risk uh, using a social network in quite an automated and unique way. Um, so yeah, what I'll do is I'll kind of touch on the journey with Risk Ledger um, and, and the progress we've had. I won't talk for the full 25 minutes, so I'll try and keep it kind of short and answer more questions at the end. Um, and then we'll dive into kind of some of the differences I've seen or the changes I've seen in the past year um, within kind of the way I lead teams. Um, but the journey started in April 2018. So I'd been working for about four and a half, five years at that point. Uh, and we founded the company then, me and my co-founder. And at the start, it was just myself, my co-founder and a pitch deck. Uh, and we managed to design a prototype and raise um, some investment. And then we spent the rest of 2018 and all of 2019 essentially building out a team to 10 people and building a tech platform that we could take to market. So we then went to market in 2020. Um, we managed to have a really great year. Uh, it was probably not the year I would have chosen to launch a, a product, but it worked out pretty good in the end. Um, and fast forward to today, and we're now 12 people um, and looking to expand and grow fairly rapidly. And across the journey, um, I kind of had a unique experience with leadership because I hadn't really had much experience of leadership before starting Risk Ledger. Uh, and then suddenly had to kind of very quickly learn how to, to lead a relatively small company that's growing quite quickly. Um, and then when the pandemic hit back in March last year, literally overnight, we went from being a company that was mostly office based. So we always had flexible working, but everybody um, would come into the office pretty much Monday through Friday out of choice. 
um, and overnight had to go fully remote and we've been fully remote ever since. So I saw kind of that change um, in both the environment in which you have to lead and then also in, in some of the tool sets that I use to lead the team um, as well. There's quite an interesting point there um, in that I think leadership is quite a dynamic thing. So you, you tend to have to change your leadership styles depending on the atmosphere and the specific team that you're leading as well. And um, so it's not something that you can just pick up a playbook and run with um, is my kind of personal experience of it. And I think my co-founder would, would say something very similar. Um, but yeah, before kind of jumping into some of the things that have changed, I thought I'd talk a bit about building a team, which is typically the first step or it was our first kind of experience of leadership. Um, so my co-founder was actually the first person to hire and he um, joined Risk Ledger straight out of university. So he had very little experience leading the team. Um, and one of the things we found out very quickly is that when you're choosing people, um, definitely look for attitude first and then kind of competence and skill set second. Um, you typically want energetic people, you want people who are resilient, people who are enthusiastic um, in your team because they'll help lift the whole team up. Um, and to, to kind of paint a picture, I'm sure everybody um, listening to this has, has kind of worked in a team with people where kind of the leader's a bit kind of down and um, not very energetic and kind of that, that can be um, contagious. And what you really want is people in the team to kind of lift the whole team up and help drive them forward. Um, and even if then people are having kind of down days or bad days, there's always someone else there to kind of inject a bit of energy into the room. Um, and before COVID hit, I would have said that nothing beats um, meeting people face to face, getting to know them, um, maybe working together to test if it's a fit uh, before bringing them onto the team. Um, that gives you an idea of who they are as, as people, it gives you an idea of kind of um, how you can work together, helps you build rapport with them. Um, and spending that time with them really does kind of help build that relationship that's, that's really integral for teams. Um, and as a leader, it's kind of your job to inspire them. Um, and yeah, that's one of the tools that I found really useful to kind of help instill that is a gentleman called Simon Sinek, I can't pronounce his name, Sinek. Uh, and he has a, a book and a couple of talks called Start With Why um, that I would highly recommend people uh, to kind of look at and watch. And it's essentially all about um, making sure that you you're inspiring people with kind of the mission behind what you're doing um, and starting with the reason why you're all there. Um, but then, yeah, the pandemic hit and essentially building a team moved all virtual. So um, it's harder to look for attitude and energy. I don't know how many people have uh, got a lot of experience through Zoom calls, but essentially the way people communicate is, has fundamentally changed. It's a lot more kind of verbal now. There's less um, body language, less cues. Um, and because of that, this is something that we actually haven't solved yet in the move to digital. Um, but because of that, it is a lot harder to look for attitude and energy. And the second big problem is it's a lot harder to onboard and form that initial team. Uh, and what I mean by that is that onboarding needs to now be very planned and um, it needs to be tested. And there's nothing worse than joining a team or a company um, and then very quickly kind of running into the mud where nothing's working as it should and you're not having any of the equipment that you should have. Um, and it's also very, uh, it's a lot harder to build initial relationships. So usually if you were to join a team, you'd spend the first kind of proportion of your time there trying to build relationships with people, getting to know people, and that's a lot harder to do virtually. Uh, but some of the things we did within Researcher to try and kind of combat that, um, we use some communication technologies, so things like Slack and, and Zoom. Um, and we've got a bit of software in there that essentially will randomly pair two people up. Um, so it takes kind of the whole company and splits you into two groups and it'll pair you up uh, each week. And so that way you're constantly meeting people, chatting to them, if there are any new team members, they, they kind of get to know the whole team pretty quickly. Uh, but moving away from building a team and moving more into then uh, running a team or, or leading a team, um, the first kind of pillar I wanted to touch on was communication. Um, and the first thing that I learned about communication essentially is that it's something that you can practice and get good at relatively quickly. And what I mean by that is that go out and talk to people, even if it's not within kind of the team that we're talking about. So your team within the army or, or within a company, um, do your best to talk to as many people as possible, get to know kind of how to communicate with people, uh, learn how to actively listen. So you're listening to them just as much as you're speaking. Um, and over time, you'll find that your communication becomes a lot clearer, becomes a lot more confident, uh, a lot more structured, and also it becomes a lot more transparent as well. Um, you become more comfortable uh, telling the truth, even if, for example, the truth isn't necessarily uh, what people want to hear. Um, and I have a bit of a confession to make. I wasn't air cadet, which I did mention in front of a, a friend who's ex army the other week, and he told me, well, at least I wasn't Navy. Um, but you guys have some great tools that, that I learned there that I still use today um, in the business world. So SMEAC, when you're briefing people, um, is a really good kind of framework and tool to use. 
Um, and bottom line up front, so when you're sending an email, just making sure that, that first sentence is, is kind of the, the key point of the email and typically in bold, uh, really helps kind of convey the information you need to convey in, in quite a nice and concise way. Um, and then the second thing I learned about communication very early on is that it's very much two way. So again, there are times when you need to be more of an autocratic leader. And I'd say that tends to be more tactical where you're telling people um, tasks that need to be achieved. Um, but very much communication should be two way and you should be listening to your team as much as you are talking to them. Um, and that's very important for two reasons. So firstly, it kind of helps build rapport with the team and the team start to trust you because they feel like you are taking on their, their opinions and their thoughts. And secondly, like the, the main point I feel of having a team is so that it's not just you completing a task, you have kind of a, a load of resources there to help and support you in achieving whatever the, the task or mission is. Um, and so listening to those kind of other people and, and hearing their thoughts on how to complete the task really can um, help accelerate the, 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 the drive towards kind of the objective. And um, yeah, since last March, um, comms has suddenly went from being, for example, with us, everybody in the office talking to each other face to face to being uh, basically fully virtual. Um, and one of the interesting things we found is that there's less kind of random conversations coming up. So less serendipity um, and less what we call kind of innovative conversations. So a lot of the innovation that we came across was very much where people were just chatting over a, a cup of coffee or, or a water or a tea or whatever. Um, and there's less of those conversations now because people are stuck in their bedrooms and you have to actually be actively call someone through Zoom uh, to be able to talk to them. Uh, and the other thing we found is that there's less body language involved. And when you're talking to people through Zoom, it tends to be very intense kind of direct eye to eye contact through a screen. Um, and that makes it a lot more awkward to discuss things that might be easier face to face. So having kind of critical conversations or having conversations about, for example, performance uh, become a lot harder when you're doing it through a virtual setting. Uh, so some of the things kind of we did to, to try and mitigate some of those changes essentially were we try and get the team together at least once a week as the whole team. This gets harder the bigger teams you run. Um, we're currently 12 people, so it's still fairly manageable. Um, but getting everybody together in a room, um, giving a briefing, and then at the end, allowing some time for everybody to speak about what they think is important. So asking them if there's anything on their mind, going through each one by one, um, I found really kind of helps keep an inclusive atmosphere with the team, helps everyone stay engaged and, and make sure that everybody's kind of aligned with, with whatever that week's objective is. Uh, and then we also kind of use a lot of tech. So um, I know, for example, our developers use something called Discord, which is almost like a push to talk systems so that they're constantly chatting to each other as and when they, they are able to. Um, and the business side of the team use more kind of Slack and Zoom. So it's a bit more you have to prompt the conversation. Um, but we are kind of communicating with each other. Uh, I would say on average, probably more so than we would in the office when we were sat there working away on our laptops. Um, and the key thing we've learned is over communicate. So never be afraid to say something, even if you think it's not um, maybe needed in the conversation. But one thing we found early on is that people make a lot more assumptions when you're having a virtual conversation. So they'll tend to want the conversation to be as concise as possible. Um, and that leads to kind of assumptions being made and things not being clarified. So pretty early on, we made a rule where um, everybody should over communicate and the other person on the other side of the conversation should be able to understand that that person is over communicating. And we never want a scenario where somebody's saying, oh, you don't need to say that, I already know it. That may be a given, but um, it's always better to over communicate and make sure that everyone uh, is aware of what's going on. Um, and yeah, the final thing kind of uh, point to mention on communication is that it's really hard to judge emotions. Um, so a recent example, basically running the company everything that's negative gets floated up to me and I'm kind of like the, the, the chief problem solver as it were. Um, and in a way that over time kind of gets quite draining. So we've literally just had a review where we've kind of told people to start spreading some of the good news as well. And you'll find that running um, teams and, and leading teams in a remote age, typically information that only needs to be shared is shared. And that often can kind of block information that's, that's, that you wouldn't immediately think is important that has to be shared from being shared. And that can lead to some kind of unforeseen um, and circumstances. But yeah, uh, communication is something that you can practice. And there's also kind of some great books out there and tools that you can utilize to get better at it. Uh, the one I'd recommend is one by an author called Chris Voss, who's an ex FBI negotiator. And he has a book called Never Split the Difference, which essentially talks about how to communicate with people and negotiate um, in, in conversations, which I found really helpful. Um, the second kind of domain that I wanted to look at and the changes uh, that we experienced was around firefighting. Um, and by that, I mean kind of problem solving. 
So as a leader, you will find that uh, the buck stops with you. And because of that, a lot of the problems that, that teams come across when trying to complete an objective or a task will float up to you. So you have to be um, kind of very comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, and to give you an example, I'm 27. I watch the same kind of BBC news that, that everybody does. But when the pandemic hit, a lot of the questions um, from the company were being fielded at me about the pandemic. Um, and so you kind of have to be comfortable making decisions based on things that you might not know fully. Um, and yeah, so the, the kind of the, the way that we mitigate that or the way that I recommend leaders mitigate that is just to be completely transparent and honest. So if you don't know something, tell people you don't know it, but then come up with an opinion or with a, um, but I think this because of this, trying to come up with, with, with a response anyway. Um, oftentimes when you're faced with kind of a, a decision that you need to make that you don't know the right answer to, you'll have an inkling on which way you think you should, should go or what the answer to the decision is. Um, and I generally kind of caveat it with, I'm not sure, does anyone else have, have an opinion on this? But my opinion is we should do this because, and then uh, justify it. Um, and really this is kind of a, a softer skills point. Being a leader, you have to be very comfortable constantly fighting fires and constantly um, hearing kind of uncomfortable things. Uh, and that comes through practice. So I'd say um, basically try and get out of your comfort zone as much as possible. And over time, you'll become more and more comfortable being outside of your comfort zone. Um, and make sure you volunteer for leadership uh, positions or positions of responsibility. Um, and over time, you will become a lot more comfortable in them. Uh, and then the third kind of um, big thing that we found with the change from, from working in offices to remote was around motivation. So one of the key kind of things that a leader looks to do with the team is motivate them and always um, bring energy to the team and drive them towards, towards an objective. Um, and like as a leader, yeah, you need to bring a really kind of strong positive attitude to the team because that is contagious. I'm sure people here have, have worked for a leader where they might not have been the most positive and that tends to, to almost project a negative energy onto the whole team and bring the whole team down. Um, so yeah, uh, this kind of, the way that, that I found motivation and trying to stay motivated, it's all about kind of self-resilience and positivity in your own self. So the more and more you come across difficult situations and you come out the other side with, with learnings or having kind of been successful, uh, the more and more comfortable you will be staying positive through these scenarios because you kind of always know that it's not, not necessarily the end of the world. Um, and that comes with experience. Um, but with the move to remote, essentially, it's really hard to judge people's mood and emotion through something like Zoom. Um, yeah, so it's when you're having a conversation with them, it tends to be a lot more verbal and especially kind of it changes between cultures, but people tend to be very bad at actually verbally communicating how they're feeling. Um, and that goes back to that original kind of communication point on over communicate. So if somebody asks you how you're doing, make sure you over communicate the answer back to them um, and be aware that people are over communicating. And so they will um, look to, to maybe ask questions that you're not that comfortable asking, uh, answering, in which case feel free to say that back to them. Uh, and do invest time in virtual workshops and events uh, and maintain kind of relationship building exercises. So one of the things that we found out quite early on is that when we were back in the office, everybody was meeting up weekly for kind of drinks after work. And now with the move to remotes, um, you have to kind of bring your socials on to Zoom. And for anybody on here who has done a Zoom social, they're not the most fun. Um, but do kind of invest time into Zoom socials, into kind of online events or whatever you can do to keep the team together. Um, if you can go out and meet each other for exercise, going for jogs and, and stuff like that, do do that too. Um, and then do look, as I said, at other bits of technology to help support this. So um, we, as I said, have a bit of software that matches people up each week and, and gets them to sit down and have a coffee with each other, uh, which has been really good at, at kind of building those relationships um, as best we can in a virtual world. And I thought I'd kind of say a quote from a gentleman called Lou Holtz, who is a US um, football coach or was a US football coach. Um, and he basically said that um, in life, you're either growing or you're dying. And that's kind of true of a team. So either you're kind of the team is growing as a team and you're building up more relationships um, or the team is kind of pulling apart and, and, um, and going on the downwards uh, slope. It's very rare and I would say almost impossible to kind of maintain a team um, at a certain level. Uh, and it, it takes constant investment, constant energy um, and constant kind of drive to, to make sure your team is constantly improving um, over time. Uh, and then finally, I just thought I'd touch on kind of my thoughts on the future. Um, but kind of what we've seen over the past year is that people are a lot more comfortable now being remote and speaking to each other digitally through kind of different technologies. Um, I do think that after kind of COVID is done, there will be a bit of a rebound um, back to kind of face-to-face -face, um, offices and face-to-face -face type scenarios. 
Um, but I think it's quite good that everybody has kind of adopted tech a lot more and is a lot more comfortable speaking to each other through technology in a way. Um, because I think it means that the world we come out of um, after all of this will be kind of a lot more balanced. Uh, people will be a lot more comfortable kind of working remotely and leading teams remotely rather than um, thinking everything had to be face to face. Um, and with that, so yeah, with that, I'll stop there. Does anyone have any questions or um, maybe what could be useful, any kind of areas that they want me to dive into a bit more? Um, leadership is one of those things that you either spend kind of three hours talking about or quick two minutes at high level um, because you can talk about it a lot. Uh, but yeah. Thank you, Aidan. Very stimulating talk. Um, we are already receiving lots of questions, so I'm sure you will have plenty of occasions to expand on your points. We now move on to our next and last speaker, Max Buchan, who is the CEO of Word. Max started his career uh, at the CoinShare Group as the company's first employee, helping it to grow this into Europe's largest digital asset manager with offices in five locations and over $1 billion assets under management. Words solve security and data protection in team communication without compromising usability. Max, the floor to you. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Is that good? Good stuff. Well, firstly, thanks everyone so much for having me today. Um, looking forward to kind of chatting and, and fielding questions a little bit later. In terms of the structure, I've really been thinking like how to go through this. I think probably what's most valuable is I'll just tell you a tiny bit about my story, how I kind of got here what I'm up to now. Um, but I think what's quite nice about this forum is like, obviously we're not pitching to you, right? I mean, I spend a lot of my time on the phone to venture capitalists or a lot of the time doing enterprise sales deals. But here, I think it's quite nice to practice radical transparency uh, in a forum like this, where we can be open and honest because there is, it is undoubtedly the case that when you're starting a company, when you're scaling a company, especially at a young age, there are many pitfalls. And there are many things that are really, really difficult. And I don't think we get the opportunity to, to discuss them enough. So as in, in, my, uh, in the kind introduction you gave me, um, as was mentioned a minute ago, my career started um, at another company. I was the first employee at a hyper, hyper growth finance startup. It was an absolutely mental experience. In the first year, we went from 25 million assets under management to 1.9 billion. Um, I was 22 years old at the time. As I say, the first employee, we scaled massively, hired a lot of people and opened up five offices. Uh, so I think we were present in New York, London, Stockholm, Paris and Jersey uh, by the time by the time I left. In terms of learnings, though, you know, it's really nice to be able to point to successful things that you've been part of and all the fun that you had. But I think there's a really there's a dark side that can come from all these things. Certainly from my perspective, it was what it can do to both your physical and mental health. Um, I've definitely never worked so hard in my life you know, pulling all nighters, things that I would definitely not suggest and never want to replicate in my own team. And I came out of that business uh, with serious health issues. I mean, I, I know it's probably not as much of a problem in the army because you guys are naturally a lot more fit than I was back then. But my physical fitness going so badly at the time that I was traveling all the time, going to New York, you know, every, every other month, going to Stockholm, all these kind of places, which were fantastic. But I was just kind of really living day to day while, while trying to grow this business. And I think that was a massive learning going to the new company. I realized that what I really wanted to do is, is become sustainable. And that was something that I really had to learn for myself and unfortunately learned kind of the hard way because really what we're not doing is kind of, you know, and, and as you will all know, you're not really in this for the short term. You know, you're not learning how to be a leader for the next six months. You know, you're learning for the next, you know, six to 60 years. And I think building sustainability into your kind of day to day into how you operate is really key. And I know from my, my end, it certainly has been. And it leads me on to kind of what I'm doing now. I, I'll give you a very, very high level um, overview of what we do. But essentially, um, we built kind of a similar thing to WhatsApp for very big enterprises where they can communicate in that way, but where all the data is stored locally. So it's not trusted with Facebook. It's not trusted with Microsoft. It's all stored within their own company and they own all the encryption keys. It was a very, very complex thing to build. And this is where I kind of come back to the point of essentially um, being a young leader and the challenges that you face. We were building an extremely complicated solution around encryption, around data localization, and something that obviously I couldn't do myself. You know, And as a 25 year old, one of my main jobs was convincing phenomenal people, whether they were PhDs in astrophysics, encryption experts, designers, to kind of follow me on this journey. 
And one thing I know is, you know, I am less than half of the average age in my company. And, you know, I, I think I was quite worried at, um, about that at, at, at the beginning. You know, how would that look to other people? Would they be comfortable following this 25 year old, um, you know, through this journey? And I think one of my immediate learnings to do that, and I'm sure something that you will have experienced as well, was again, I just the, the narrative had to be completely transparent as well. You know, I wasn't going to pretend to be anything that I, I wasn't, and I wasn't going to pretend I had all these skills that I hadn't mastered yet, because obviously I'm relatively short on a tooth still, and that would, that would be impossible. But I think being completely honest with people when they were coming in and saying, look, I'm strong at, strong at this kind of thing. I've done this in the past and I can bring this to the table, but here are my weaknesses. And I think as a leader, we don't talk about that enough. And I think often the narrative is everyone's going to look to me. I need to be able to solve every issue. Whereas I absolutely promise you, you, you won't be able to, um, you know, you probably to be able to do most of them, but sometimes you will come unstuck. And it's where I, I guess I come back to this point where someone asked me in a recent interview, uh, what I thought like the three most important things to growing a business were. And I said, well, the, the, the three things are people, people, and people. And what I mean by that is the first tranche of what I'm talking about here is your team. Obviously those are the people that you're kind of, um, you're really going into all this too, and you're going to be very close to and fighting every day alongside them. The second is obviously who you do business with, in the, you know, when you're growing a company, the source of deals that you do, and when you're hyper growing a company is kind of your, I don't know, institutional clients, whoever it is. But the third one is kind of more interesting. The third group of people that I mentioned are the kind of mentors that you can have around you. And from my perspective, I think that's probably been the most important thing for me on this journey is having mentors. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, as I mentioned, I kind of started this journey when I was 22. I mean, I, you know, I was fresh out of university. I had an absolute wild ride, but there was so much I didn't know. And so much I didn't know still, I still don't know. And I think having people that you can lean on and who will pick up the phone to you is phenomenal. Uh, and I managed to do that quite early on. So I have a really, really phenomenal mentor called, called Lara, who's the CEO of one of the most recognizable media brands in the world. And the fact that I can speak to these people, you know, if, if the chips are down, I can just call them and say, look, I've got this slightly difficult problem. What do you think? And I think as a leader, it's really important to realize, you know, as the saying goes, you're not an island. But I think it's really true. It's it's realizing that you do have people around you. I don't think anyone expects you to always have every answer and to just be open to always, always like speaking to people who may know better. And also, you know, being open to like just ferociously learn, learn new things. So I think as an overview, those were the immediate things that I was kind of learning at that time, but still do. I mean, as I told you, we, you know, we brought specialists in, whether it's astrophysics, encryption, all that kind of stuff. And I think one thing for me is, I think as, as Hayden mentioned, you are often looked to as being the problem solver. And that is 100% true, especially in entrepreneurialism. At the end of the day, your one job leading a company is to kind of try and solve the problems that, that people can't do on their own. But in terms of like how you build a culture around that, we realized early on that, that if we could, were to kind of build this, I so, suppose kind of horizontal culture where everyone felt that their ideas really mattered, it would be a way of us as a collective starting to solve problems. And I realized that that was quite powerful. To give you an example of that, we might have a new feature or a new part of the technology that we want to build. You know, me as the CEO, I, I just don't have that specific skill. I'm not going to be able to go and code it myself. So even if one of the team members could says, hey, Max, I really don't know what to do about this. At the end of the day, chances are I'm, I probably don't either. But what we can do is have a sit down and be like, OK, what is the requirement? And, you know, I think this is kind of advice that you can take in any field. Like, what is the system requirement? What is the general requirement? And then if you have a team that trusts you, and if you really trust your team, you can sit down. And when you have this complete meritocracy of ideas, it's this really powerful thing where like everyone feels they can contribute. And they're not necessarily seeing you as the absolute, you know, end game in working this out. And then you can kind of sit down and start to arrive at some decent ideas. And to go back to that example I was, I was giving, we had a thing where we were getting a huge amount of users signed up. And we run in, ran into the problem, which is a nice problem to have, where you have too much demand, but it's still a problem. I mean, we literally couldn't launch the technology fast enough. 
And some of the biggest fi Fortune 500 companies were contacting us, all these kind of people. We did not know how to, how, to, how to onboard them fast enough. So I went back with one of my lead engineers and we just kind of spent a couple of days really brainstorming the kind of logic tree of that, how would that pan out? And obviously he ended up being the one that solved, solved it, but just sitting there and me kind of trying to guide really from a, like a high process logic standard point of view, he was then able to kind of think about it in the technological way, in the coding way and be able to go and implement that. So that's been, that's been really interesting. But I think, and I know Hayden, Hayden looked to the future a bit as well. I think for me, where I see kind of this going in the next five, five to 10 years, I mean, you know, I think that's so much what a leader is about. I often refer to Evan Spiegel on this. It's a really great quote. Evan Spiegel, if anyone doesn't know, is the founder and CEO of Snapchat. But he said, when you're a tech CEO, you really have two jobs. You have to make sure you don't run out of money and you have to hire the best people. And I completely agree. And it kind of, kind of summarizes what I'm saying in a way of, you know, it really comes down to getting smart people around you so you can listen to them. You're not getting smart people around you so you can tell them what to, what to do. You're getting them around you so they can, they can help tell you what to do. And I think that's really, really powerful. And I think where we're going now is my plan, especially for this, for this company going forward is, you know, just continue to be really, um, really stringent about keeping that com company culture, even as we scale. I mean, we're in a massive hiring phase. And even though we're only about 10 people now, we'll be about 30 people in the next three months. And you start to go through these tranches of hiring and keeping that style of leadership is one of the most difficult things. And that's also what I'd definitely really suggest thinking about more is also how your style of leadership changes at scale. Because, you know, some of you might be leading five people, some of you might be leading 50. But there will also be some of you that go through that process, whether it's through promotions, whether it's through, I don't know, acquiring other groups under, under your command. Working out ways that you can scale your base theories as a leader, I think is really, really crucial. And to give you like that example, I mean, when we started with two of us, this wasn't really, you know, a particular issue. But when we started going through these, like, you know, theorizing around the fact that we probably need to have this, this completely non-hierarchical way of dealing with kind of, you know, new ideas of, of this kind of lateral way of thinking, we knew that when we got the first two guys, that was working really well. And then when we got to 10 people, we were like, if we can still make that happen, it's going to be really brilliant. And a really big challenge for us is how do we make sure we keep that complete, complete um, horizontal kind of hierarchy of ideas when we get to 30 people, when we get to 100, 300? And, you know, that's something I'm still dealing with and I don't really have all the answers for that. But it's just something I really, really think about a lot in this journey. And I think my one of my last points on this is, you know, to come full circle, I guess, on the topic of what we're talking about today which I suppose in, in essence is kind of what makes a good leader in this day and age, and especially in the digital sphere. And I, I think often there's a pressure, especially on young leaders to be very, very good at a specific vertical. And what I mean by that is, you know, it, just to, to link it to my world, you might be a phenomenal coder, right? You might be a phenomenal designer, but those are really, really specific verticals. And I think the most important thing as, as a leader is, is to not kind of be a jack of all trades, but have that complete lateral thinking. For me, that's helped so much. It's not kind of going deeply into one specific field, but having a broader picture all of the time, not just of what's currently going on, but what you see going on 12 months down the, low, down the road, 24 months. And I think really your main job as a leader is not only kind of seeing that kind of lateral field of view, but also always keeping your eye on the future. Because at the end of the day, the people that are, that are working for you, the people that are on your team will always be dealing with the day to day, right? It's their job to be there and always be dealing with the day to day and kind of putting out fires on all those kind of things. But as a leader, you need to be laterally thinking across the organization. How can I help with this thing? How can I help with that thing? While at the same time, keeping a very, very firm eye on the future. Because as the leader, you need to be very cognizant of things coming down the road that at the end of the day, the people that you lead just won't be aware of. In the tech world, I mean, the, re the reason why that's specifically relevant is, you know, I'm out there all the time speaking to, to the clients and speaking to, you know, different jurisdictions. At the moment, we're massively expanding jurisdiction approach. Like we started in the UK right now. We're very present in Brazil, starting our presence in Singapore. 
our team though i mean they don't deal with that at all but it's my responsibility to kind of keep an eye on the regulation environment in singapore for instance and be able to communicate that in a very very efficient way of saying hey this new financial regulation is coming into effect in singapore in six months that will mean that fundamentally we need to slightly alter the technology to, to do this with data instead of that and i think that's kind of the last thing on that that i want to mention is that's extremely important because that's something that only you can do and i guess it's slightly it's counterintuitive to my first message which was you know you're not alone and you know keeping people around you is very important but i think looking at the future is the one thing as a leader that you need to always be doing and i know this will change for some some of you more than others where you might have uh, leaders yourself that you might be leading a team but you might have people um, superior to you who you can report into but that's really been my main lesson in this entrepreneurial journey and i think in terms of my last my my last thoughts to wrap this up you know i think it's firstly i think this program is phenomenal about you know, learning more about this world. I know that the tech world is slightly different to what you're doing with, dealing with right now, but there are so many lessons, I think, about leadership that I've mentioned in the last 20 minutes that simply just apply cross vertically, whatever you do, whether you're in finance, law, you know, whether you're in the military, whether you're in tech. And I think as a leader as well, one of the main responsibilities is really just always learning. And I think that's, you know, in a way, possibly the most important thing that I just really want to kind of conclude with, because I think that's what saved me the most in all of this is that continuous desire to act, to learn every single day. And it goes back to my first point that I, I really don't have all the answers, despite kind of giving this talk now. You know, I wish I did, but there isn't really a silver bullet for leadership. There isn't kind of an instruction manual, a one size fits all that you can read and then you're kind of good to go. This has been my journey for the last five years in the startup world of this kind of crazy growth environment, but it will be completely different to someone else in a very similar position. And I think the only thing you can do, which is going to be completely true, no matter what you do is continue to learn, you know, whether that's as in technology, learning new programming languages, you know, learning new ways of coding, knowing new architectures, you know, whether it's in law and you're just, there's more, there's more regulatory climates happening all the, all the time. As a leader, I think linking back to that futuristic standpoint, keeping learning every single day also is a bulletproof way of protecting against the future and making sure you're completely ready for everything that's going to come your way. Those are really the main messages that I wanted to communicate today. I might be slightly under time, but th those are my last thoughts I'll leave you with. Thank you, Max. Very, very stimulating talk as well. And uh, we are receiving lots of good questions. And uh, I will address the question to both of you. The first one is the most popular one is the chief of the general staff, which in, you know, in the civilian jargon is like the bosses. I've introduced the key SEB, which highlights that behavior is a key attribute in today's army. How long has the organization applied this thought? And if it's a newly introduced, how soon do you see this benefiting your mission success at a strategic level? Um, Hayden, Hayden Brooks? Yeah, so um, we basically did this. This was the first thing I think my co-founder and I did when founding the company. We sat down and kind of wrote down six or seven key values that we'd look for um, in people that we'd like to work with. And that was quite good, I suppose, just for leaders to do, because it meant that the leaders like me and him sat down and, and kind of hashed out what we thought the company should look like and, and kind of what, what the culture should look like. Um, and it's been really good since then because that's almost our first hiring gate. So when we're looking at hiring people, um, that's kind of our first filter that we use. Do, do they meet uh, these, these kind of values that we have? And those values are things like resilience, honesty, um, diligence. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few few of them, we've got about six or seven. Um, in terms of how they've affected the company, so we've only ever we've only ever had a company with those values instilled within it. Um, but I would assume essentially the team gelled really quickly, and I think the reason for that is because it helps build kind of trust and rapport between people. If you know that the other person kind of holds the same values that you do, um, and it also helped. We chose values that we knew would be beneficial for the company as the company went through large periods of growth. So things like resilience, and it's definitely definitely helped ease the friction whenever we've had to go through kind of challenges like that. Thank you very much. Max? Uh, it's an interesting one. I think around behavior is, I think, increasingly pertinent now because we're all operating in this very digital world. And I think what I mean by that is keeping morale 
in a really good place is so crucial. And especially when you're operating, I mean, for us, half of our employees are in the UK, but half of them across Europe, right? So, I mean, you know, I'm speaking to someone in Switzerland or whatever it is, or, or in Germany, wherever. If we don't have good morale across the team, it's kind of, it can, the opposite bad morale can spread extremely quickly. And it's something we have been probably most aware of when we've been hiring. Because a lot of our employees I've never actually physically met, which is very strange in a way. You know, I've only actually ever met them on Zoom because if they're not in the country, obviously travel is impossible at the moment as well. And what we realize that having necessarily necessary skills is important, but almost what's more important at the moment is the is kind of does the behavior match. And, you know, is it, is it going to impact on morale? Because I think fundamentally bringing anyone in that might kind of bring down the team will completely scupper everything that you, you've done. So I think that's what we look for most when we're hiring is, you know, how, how do they fit in with the team and, and how does that kind of work together? Because I think building the right culture is one of the most important things you can do as a, as a leader. Thank you very much. The next question is about uh, uh, how you've developed as a leader. You've been speaking with a great authority on leadership. Um, how did you become a leader? Uh, how did you train through business or did you have uh, uh, any defining life experiences growing up that shaped you as a leader? It's a deep question. I haven't really thought too much about that. Um, so I think I mentioned I was an air cadet as a kid and so kind of got experience through leadership there. We did a lot of leadership kind of exercises and kind of trainings um, and, and ended up kind of leading teams a lot on exercises then. Um, and then through uni, um, I kind of played uh, quite a lot of sports, which definitely kind of instilled a sense of leadership in you and a sense of kind of team atmosphere, which was good. Um, but then, yeah, otherwise it would have was purely just through business. Um, and I suppose like on, on the point of us speaking with great authority on leadership, I wouldn't consider myself kind of um, a great leader yet. It's I've led a company now for, for kind of three years and, and hopefully for many more. Um, but by there'll be people in the audience who, who are a lot more experienced in the leadership world than, than myself, for sure. Um, yeah, I think it's the one thing I will say on leadership. It definitely I've definitely seen my skills improve the more I've done it. So I think it's one of those things that you will make mistakes and you have to be comfortable making mistakes. And the amount of times I've made mistakes in front of the team um, and you just have to know how to kind of recover from them and, and move on um, and learn from them more critically. Um, so that in the future you, you make less mistakes. Uh, it's all about kind of iterative learning. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to echo Hayden's point, I, I completely agree. And I'm by, by no means, you know, standing here to say I know everything about leadership, but exactly the same as Hayden. I, I think the best we can do is kind of share our learnings, you know, over the last couple of years. And, that, and that's interesting. But um, yeah, obviously, there's no complete definitive approach or, or even kind of guide. In terms of like the exposure I had to leadership before this, I was really lucky to be part of like a hyper growth start, startup before this. And what was interesting about that is I worked directly for the CEO. I mean, originally there were two of us, so that was very easy to do. Um, but, you know, when we went north of 100 global employees, it was a very, very different organization. And I often say, like, a CEO in an organization is kind of like the buffer between the company and the outside world. And what was really nice is I got to learn in this crazy environment, but I had a buffer. Like, there was always someone, like, between me and the kind of scary outside world. So I got to kind of work really close with Ryan, this American chap who was my CEO, and it was his third very, very successful business. Um, and now what's quite funny for me is like now I'm the buffer for, for kind of the, the, these other people in my organization. Uh, and I, I was just very lucky, I guess, to have that experience for a couple of years, at least being one removed, um, you know, to just learn. So, yeah, that, that's just from my perspective there. And just to add to that, that's a really good point around learning from other, other leaders. Um, so the more time you spend around kind of great leaders or even bad leaders, the more you learn what is good and what is what is bad. And you can bring that into, into your own leadership style. Um, and then there's some kind of other tools that you can use. So one of the one of my advisors once told me, whenever you're faced with kind of a tough decision, take a step back and then think about a story where a character was facing that decision and what, what would you like to read in a story? And kind of that helps provide a bit of perspective and, and it's quite a nice way to think through um, how to kind of get through tough conversations or whatever it might be. Thank you very much. The next question is, in this climate with remote working, how do you instill and promote the culture and ethos of your company? And what does what you do now differs from what you were doing before the pandemic? 
Aiden. <laughs> um, so in terms of instilling culture, that I think comes down to communication um, partly. Uh, so we we kind of really drive into the team that they need to be constantly communicating with each other. As I said, the techies are all on Discord pretty much um, every day, uh, talking to each other as if they're in the office. Um, the business team, we we have two or three separate kind of functions within the business, but we, we make sure that there's a stand up every day for each function and that all the functions get together a couple of times during the week as well. Um, and one thing we found useful is having transparency behind the, the team goals. So within each kind of micro team within the wider organization, um, knowing what that team's working on and, and how well they're achieving it and then striving to achieve it allows other kind of parts of the organization to help them if, if they're falling short. Um, and also allows other parts of the organization to kind of share in their success if they are meeting the goals as well. And that kind of helps drive a sense of, of camaraderie amongst everyone, I suppose. Um, but it's, it's a challenge for sure. So I think if you were to ask myself or my co-founder um, if we would prefer to work remote or in an office, the minute we can, we'll be going back to an office um, ASAP because we much prefer kind of seeing people and, and working with people rather than through Zoom. Um, and yeah, that culture then comes back to, I always think of culture as start with you. Um, and the way you act kind of will instill the culture in the company and they'll kind of look at you and think, okay, that's, that's the way we're approaching kind of these, these problems will mimic that as well. Um, the wider team. So yeah, just try and live, live by your values, be honest, be transparent, um, would be kind of my advice on that. Thank you very much. Max? Yeah, just to jump in there. I think, I think, you know, it's a great question. I think the answer is it's exceedingly difficult, right? I mean, Tayden says, I think we'd all rather be, in a face-to-face -face environment it is very very difficult to build that kind of sense of culture i think also in our in our kind of size of business both around kind of 10 employees it's easier in a way because it culture is kind of a non-defined thing where we are and it kind of fluctuates and it grows and it becomes um solidified over time but the nice thing is when you're about 10 people everyone kind of makes their mark as well like you know when you get into really big tech companies i don't know thousand plus people you kind of already have a pretty defined culture one of the nice things of where we we are like Aidan and myself is I guess for, for you know not to assume but I kind of guess you have a similar thing to me is it's quite nice to see it evolving with with more people the, the last thing I'd say is while it is difficult I have a pretty good barometer for kind of how kind of culture is is growing in in the organization for me it's like chatting on weekends and by that I don't mean working and I really don't promote working on weekends I, I just literally mean chatting I'll give you an example. I've got one really uh, fantastic guy on the team and he has twin girls and they make gluten-free cakes uh, every weekend. Anyway, and he posts them on a Sunday, the, these amazing creations that he's made and everyone kind of has a chat. And what's really nice about that is what, when you can see relationships building separately from anything to do with work, I think that's one way of kind of starting to think, I think we might be being successful right now in culture. If people actually like each other enough to, to discuss outside of work. Thank you very much, Max and Aiden. And uh, we have another question. Uh, Max has already partially answered this in his talk, but just to reiterate, and if you want to pick it up again, is how many people are within your team and company? And have you had any issues with leading due, due to your age? Have you found it challenging to lead people older than you? And have you overcome, how have you overcome this challenge? Uh, Aiden, would you like to start? Yeah, so we're now 12 people. We're a relatively young team overall. Um, we, we do have employees older than me. Uh, I've never found it too much of a challenge, funnily enough, within the team leading because of my age, because leadership, again, it falls back to kind of that leadership style and what fits, fits the room at that right time. But I'd say leading in a tech company is a lot more about kind of the, the strategic view rather than kind of the authoritative tactical view. Um, because of this, you act more like a facilitator. Um, and as CEO, for example, I, as Max said, I don't know how to build technology. I don't know how to do much marketing. Um, I don't know much about legal, so I'm kind of a generalist that can throw myself at anything and, and hopefully help. Um, and because of that, you end up almost facilitating and, and learning from other people and bringing them in to apply their kind of experience and knowledge to problems. Um, and if you give people kind of the respect and, and the time and allow them to contribute, then, yeah, leadership would never be seen, I don't think, as, a, as something that's threatening or something that can create kind of conflict. Um, if it is being seen as something that's threatening or creating conflict, I think it would depend on, you'd have to kind of look at why you think that is. Um, but that typically, I think, would be down to kind of a breakdown of either rapport or communication between you and the, the person involved. Um, but no, um, funnily enough, never had never had a problem because of my age. Um, and yeah, try and listen to, to all the experiences that everyone has and, and kind of take them on board um, and then make the decision based on, based on that. Thank you very much, Max. 
Yeah, I mean, I know I talked about this slightly um, from an overview level in my talk. I've also kind of never had like direct issues with it. I mean, I am by far the youngest person on the team. I mean, the average in our team is about 40, um, just because kind of the level of you know, security architects, a lot of our stuff is around encryption and people who have been around the scene 20, 25 years, right? They, the average tends to not be the same age as me. Um, that being said, I really haven't dealt with that. I think because when people come in at an early stage, they're not really joining the company as it is now. They're joining based on your vision of where it's going to be in two years, right? And I think that's your job to come back to a leader is, again, looking at the future and kind of just describing how that's going to be. And I think that's the main thing is all of these people are really just jumping on your vision. I mean, we had, um, I had one phenomenal guy just join um, who was a very, very senior designer at a, at a dating application called Bumble, which is one of the biggest in the world that you, that you might know, you know, and for him to, to leave such a huge company to kind of come to us, you know, it wasn't for where we are now. It's again, what the vision was and what I was kind of trying to, trying to sell to him. Um, so yeah, for, that's from a high level. The only time where I've ever had an issue it seems more of an insecurity thing. Like I've sometimes interviewed people and they, they've been a bit weird about it. And then obviously, you know, straight away that kind of that probably won't work out in the longer term because most people that are really secure in themselves really know they know their specific niche really well. They really don't care. They're like, I'm coming in to solve this particular problem. And I really believe in your wider vision. But some people I've, I've noticed can be a bit insecure about other things, but it does happen very rarely. Yes, and that's a really good point at the end there. And to, to add on to that, um, I think a lot of it can be even insecurity in yourself and you'll perceive maybe problems within the team as them not respecting you because of your age. Um, when at the end of the day, it could be something you said, it could be a decision you made that they don't agree with. Uh, and again, it comes back to that communication point. Um, so I wouldn't always assume that, that just because something has happened or something that there's been a bit of friction or somebody said something that it's down to um, your age being a factor. For sure, for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, again, you have already touched briefly upon uh, this topic, but if you could please expand, is about how you adapt to your leadership style, uh, depending on whether you are dealing with a new team member you have never met in person, but only online, and how this compares to people you know very well and you've worked with for a long time and then have moved to work remotely. What is the difference between the leadership style in both cases? Uh, Aidan? Yeah, so I think the, the, the core kind of tenets of the leadership styles are relatively similar. So kind of having those values and, and driving forward towards a vision and, and instilling kind of um, inspiration and motivation in people kind of all, all exists no matter who I'm talking to. Um, I'd say naturally that the more rapport you have with someone and the longer you've known them, the more comfortable you are with them. So you can kind of, um, you can be a bit more banterous, you can say things that are maybe a bit more cheeky and, and you don't have to be um, as, as reserved. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the core leadership style, I'd say is the same. With a new employee, I tend to be a bit more um, a bit more open because you're trying to get to know them. There's like an initial, um, almost I'd say, few weeks where where you're having to build that rapport, kind of understand uh, why they're here, what they want to get out of the company, and how you can support that. And that tends to be more kind of a consultative type approach. Um, and then yeah, that kind of then settles down as that rapport builds and that trust builds, um, and it ends up being a lot more. I don't want to say comfortable because it's comfortable in both scenarios, but a lot more comfortable in a way. Um, yeah, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to point any point at any kind of major um, differences. Communication, I might over communicate slightly more with a new person because you find that um, with somebody you know for a long time, they will be able to pick up on um, on kind of things that, that a new person might not be able to about what you're saying or your leadership style. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting one. I, I think essentially it will be the same it's just that i find that meeting a person is a catalyst it, you know i think we all know that right it's always a catalyst for building relationships i mean to give an example when me and my co-founder was right at the, at the beginning starting out we, we hired our first engineer i'd never met him before i think he i can't remember where he was living i want to say siberia or somewhere completely out of the way uh, i know him too but we flew him to budapest and we also flew to budapest and we just spent three days with him and that was amazing because that was kind of, we had never met before. By the end of that weekend, we knew each other pretty well. Um, and we did one other trip the next month. And we actually haven't now seen him in, in person in a year and a half. But having that original, like building of a relationship really helped. That being said, obviously, we've hired a lot remotely and some team members I've still not met, as I mentioned earlier. But because they've been with us over a year now, 
I do make it a priority for just talking to them, not about work, but just literally talking to them because I, I genuinely want to get to know them as people. And I think that's really important. And it's something that when you meet in person, naturally happens because obviously when you you know when you when you meet someone over a weekend you're not going to just talk about work but i think putting that time aside in this digital age to talk about stuff that's completely unrelated is is really important you know i don't know if they're kind of so a couple of the guys just got married actually and they're kind of like talking about that really nice stuff or talking about their children and, and i think that's really important for building relationships thank you very much and one last question how would you see a way in regards of the army to work on a horizontal hierarchy with small working teams where you have higher ranks within it and where rank is the basis of how we run things? So I think in, in a way is how do you, in the, in the business world, how do you mix groups with different level of seniorities and experience? And how can this be a problem and a challenge or an opportunity? Uh, Hayden? Yeah, I'd say I've experienced teams that kind of exist on both sides of this, this coin. So I've been in teams that have been really kind of autocratic, where it's very much you're given orders, you go and execute them, you come back and you're given more orders. And then I've worked on the other side of that, where it's so kind of consultative and flat that nothing ever gets done. Um, and you kind of want to avoid both of those pitfalls. You want to be kind of somewhere in the middle. And the way I think about it, it tends to be that if you're the leader, the decision kind of rests with you and the decision has to rest with you because the buck stops with you. And if you're going to take the accountability, you have to be the one that's made that decision. Um, but in making that decision, utilize your team to help make it. So ask the team what their thoughts are. Make sure you kind of gather everybody's opinions and, and, and uh, thought processes before then making that decision. And that's usually quite a nice way to blend the two because it means you still have that autocratic um, mission driven this is what we're going to do, let's go and do it. But at the same time, you're including the team and the team are able to provide input into whatever decision is being made. Um, and I think that, that, that from what I've heard, that would work quite well. That does work quite well in the army um, because essentially then the, the, the ranked individual kind of makes the decision, but it's based on, on input from the wider team where possible. And then that, that tends to be fluid. So then the more kind of tactical the situation, if, if everything's on fire to do with the technology and you're having to fix things very quickly, you will tend to swing more towards the autocratic kind of viewpoint. Um, and then equally, if things are a lot more relaxed, you'll be a bit more kind of consultative. So you can be a bit fluid with it, but it tends to be, a, a, I'd say, a mix of both approaches works best. Yeah, it's interesting. If, if anyone ever starts a tech company, one thing you one question you will definitely have many times is what if X company does this? Like to give you an example, what if Google does this? Right. What if or what if Facebook makes this every single time, no matter what you do, it's kind of just the question that everyone asks. And I think that question is quite funny because it's more a question about corporate innovation. Like, why don't they do this? At the end of the day, these companies are huge, making a lot of revenue. They can't attack everything. And even if they do, it's sometimes hard to do it. Even an example, I've got a couple of friends who have sold companies to Facebook, to Google, but for inordinate amounts of money, but they got extremely depressed when they were there because, you know, when you get acquired by these companies, you then have to work for them for between two to four years, right? In what's called your vesting of stock and all that kind of fancy stuff but they were so depressed because they went from this environment of being like 20 people innovating every day, shipping products pretty much on a weekly basis to let's have seven meetings a day and maybe we'll release this product three years down the road. Right. And then that really impacted them and they really struggled. And it's a, it's a wider question for corporate innovation. Right. And I speak to a lot of companies about that. It struggles they have, especially large financial services firms, for, for instance. I know it's obviously not nearly the same as the military, but they are very, very hierarchical, right? Everything from the analyst to the MD, it's very, very structured. I, I am seeing, though, when I have these discussions with a lot of big corporates, they're really trying to change because obviously the value is fast-paced innovation, is making teams work nimbly. And for that, I really like Jeff Bezos's approach. I, th I think he's just a, you know, a brilliant um, f philosopher in this way. And the whole kind of pizza sharing analogy, I don't know if, you, if anyone's come across this one, but essentially like he won't let teams be bigger, bigger than a whole pizza being able to feed one of them. So I think that's about six or seven pizza. Like, can we order a pizza and it feed the whole team? And that's the maximum amount of people we can have in the team. And I think that's quite important because then you can have these like outposts and these tiny microcosms within this larger organization that can get stuff done. I know that's a slightly lateral answer, but I suppose if I'm then layering on top of those microcosms with strict hierarchy, I think in an ideal world, it should start to not matter. Of course, you have the reporting structure, but if we look at those kind of making these small teams, which you can kind of innovate faster with, you can kind of have really senior leaders there and you can have junior people. 
And if everyone's very open to working in that way, it is definitely doable. But I completely understand that it is really, really hard from a structural standpoint. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of my two cents on the matter, at least. Well, thank you very much for this. Thank you, Aidan, and thank you, Max. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's um, all three sessions concluded for today. And it uh, leaves me with the challenge of trying to summarise what was a an extremely rich, um, insightful and stimulating morning of discussion. I guess I, um, I'm encouraged by the knowledge that the fundamentals of army leadership endure and resonate not just in our organisation, but indeed in the sport and business world. Uh, the fact that we are values based, our leadership is values based. We live our values and standards every day. And the role of our leaders, of all of us, is to lead by example and to translate theory into practice and interpret those values and standards for our soldiers. And I thought Corporal Seal brought that out, that point out really well. As Command Sergeant Major Morgan said, it's about servant leadership. We are a profession who, by our very nature, serve our nation, our organization, and indeed each other. And I refer to the motto of the Royal Military Academy Sander, serve to lead, which whilst it's being monopolized by the officer corps is absolutely something that we all, um, we all refer to. We all serve to lead whatever rank we are. The importance of leadership in mission command. Now, whilst that's a command philosophy, the army's command philosophy, we cannot live that, we cannot deliver that effectively without good leadership. And it's not just a philosophy, it's a mindset. A mindset of leadership and indeed good followership. And all of the above delivered within the context of our culture. And of course the army has a very rich and long historical culture and a, and a nexus of cultures and subcultures that sit beneath our core. And of course culture shapes leadership as much as leadership shapes culture. We have a number of challenges that have been brought out today as we look through, look through, uh, look to the future. How do we ensure our people have the right knowledge, skills, experience, and behaviors necessary in the digital age? Command Sergeant, Major, Command Sergeant Major Mills, I think rightly highlights the demands that are now placed on our soldiers and our officers arguably greater than they ever have been. I'll be prepared for the future. Indeed, in some cases, as has been brought out where some of our juniors may have the skills and knowledge that is superior um, to those that are leading them. The role of technology in mission command. How can we harness the best of the technology to optimize mission command without resisting or with resisting uh, the urge to centralize control? The pervasiveness of information, mass information, misinformation and disinformation. And what role do we play as leaders to make sense of this, to distill what's important and indeed what is appropriate. And Court Richardson, I thought, articulated that point really, really well. And there are many other challenges, but I offer the following in terms of how we can deal with some of those challenges going forward. The importance of humility, the willingness to listen, to learn, and to appreciate that we don't have all the answers as leaders. There will be other people in our teams, those around us, that will have greater strengths and, and better answers than we may do. But having the humility to listen and learn from others. And again, Max brought that out really well. The importance of empathy, the ability to put yourself in the shoes of others, to see the world through their eyes. And through this, and indeed through humility, enabling people to feel valued, to feel included, and getting the very best from our diverse teams. Confidence to challenge. And that's not just about creating the challenge culture whereby you look upwards and positively and respectfully challenge those that, that, um, that lead you. But how do you as leaders create a challenge culture in your environment? Again, this parts back to having the humility to be challenged by those you lead. The importance of education, the willingness to learn, and not just education in the formal sense or indeed training in the formal sense, but learning from our day-to-day -day experiences, from our successes and our failures and learning from those around you, including again, those junior to you. About communication, and this came out once again by most of the speakers, but Hayden talked about it at length at the end, the what, when, how, and, and how much. And finally, I'd offer to, rem to remind you all that as leaders, we are responsible, so be responsible. If you want to drive change, if you want to make things better, don't just look up and ask the questions of our, of our superiors, of our seniors, 
the thing, what can you and your team do about it? Take responsibility. So we're of course living in now in a digital age and the future will only present growing challenges in terms of automation, AI, data, technology, and mass communication. So many challenges ahead, but operations in the land domain in our profession remain an intrinsically human endeavor. So I offer the following, understand your profession and do the basics well, understand your people and serve them well, and live by the values and standards. Do what you know is right and lead by example. So it leaves me to say a final thank you to all our speakers today uh, for taking the time to share their experiences with us and for putting themselves on the pedestal that itself takes leadership. And to you, the audience, for joining us today, I hope you've enjoyed the morning and learned something from that. And I revert back to my original uh, uh, opening remarks about reflection. I urge you all now to reflect on what you've learned and what you've heard here today and ask yourself, how can you be a better leader tomorrow? Thank you all. Stay safe. And thank you to your families.